Quickly before starting the video, I would like to say thank you to all of you who support me on various platforms and those of you who like my work, please consider contributing as well. It helps me and my family a lot. Once again, huge thanks and let's begin. If you were a being who lived for thousands of years, wanting to be equal to God, trying to mimic God, and knowing that one day you would be kicked out of heaven to earth, where God's creation, man is, how would you present yourself if you had absolute hatred for them? What's the best way to deceive them? How would you damn as many souls as possible? Would you come with horns and a pitchfork in your hands, or rather disguised as an angel of light? copying that what was done by Jesus Christ, who is God manifested in the flesh. How would you separate the false light from the real one? Could a serpent sacrifice one of his heads to be cut off to do this trick? Yes it could, and it will. Cut one of the evil heads and present the false light. That way you may seem like a savior figure, the Hegelian dialectic. So, the Jesus Revolution and the Sound of Freedom. What do both movies have in common? Well, that same false light. Today I will show you that Mel Gibson, Jim Caviezel, Jonathan Rumi and others are serving a bigger purpose for the Vatican. Everything's about to change, folks. Whether you're ready for it or not. Other stories of the 60s have been told, but never this story. This is a significant story that in many ways changed the world. We were doing the film Woodlawn. And the people just sitting there with masks and <laughs> smirking. Oh man, it's insanity. Before that event and said, I'm John, I'm a filmmaker. I need you <laughs> to lead. Angel Stadium in the Lord's Prayer. And that was where we met. So we just jumped right in. This is a Jonathan Rumi, who you probably know, plays Jesus and the Chosen. And uh, he's playing the role of evangelist Lonnie Frisbee, who was actually speaking on the day that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. You have to decide for yourself. We all have to decide. My name is Jonathan Rumi. I'm playing Lonnie Frisbee, the legendary enigmatic hippie street preacher who preached in Southern California in Costa Mesa at Calvary Chapel Church alongside uh, Pastor Chuck Smith, the head of Calvary Chapel Church. What is a Catholic bird doing behind Jonathan Rumi? The Holy Spirit is not a bird. When John Irwin and I saw The Chosen, you know, we're just like, the performance that he's giving is incredible. His preparation each day was to literally play Lonnie's audio tapes over and over and over again so that he can get Lonnie's cadence down. Very important for him that he just nails the essence of who Lonnie really was. Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross. It's an amazingly well-written screenplay. You rarely read scripts that speak to you on so many different levels. There's comedy, there's drama, there's tenderness, there's complexity um, with all of the characters, especially with Lonnie Frisbee. Lonnie Frisbee was a very, very complex human. It was just so beautiful to see like the, this opportunity to play somebody that 
had these, these human weaknesses and flaws, but who was so profoundly gifted in the spirit and in being able to heal people and inspire people just And by then, of course, uh, when you were casting the role of, of the man who was preaching when I came to Christ, uh, Lonnie Frisbee, uh, I remember I said to you, we have got to get Jonathan Rumi from The Chosen. And then when I met Jonathan up in LA, I thought, oh, he's the guy. So Jonathan, we're used to seeing you in the role of Jesus. Yes. But now you're in the role who is the son of God, fully God, fully man, but now you're playing the role of a, a guy who was fully man, but was used by God. How did you kind of get from the role of Jesus to the role of playing Lonnie? So uh, I don't know what it's like to play the perfectly sinless son of God. Uh, nobody does. Uh, and I don't pretend to know. I, I, I tend to try to stay out of the way when it comes to playing Jesus. Yeah. But I know what it's like to be fully human, uh, <laughs> fully, fully, uh, you know, fallible in and, and all the ways humanity can be uh, fallible and broken and weak. And uh, so I, I use a lot of my humanity in all these other, especially in a role like Lonnie Frisbee where he, he had such a, a wild and broken childhood, yeah. um, but God used that despite his weaknesses, despite uh, the trials that he went through to yeah. make him this beacon of hope, uh, this, this dynamo of the Holy Spirit with the charism of healing and touching people and reaching people's hearts and knowing that Christ was looking for them, just like he's looking for everyone here tonight that That's has right. not encountered Christ yet. Christ is looking for you. He wants to know you. He wants to get to know you on a deeper level. And so he used Lonnie in that way, and Lonnie brought thousands and thousands of hippies to Christ uh, in the early 1970s, and the world was never the same. That's right. One of the young men, Catherine, who has been so used of God is Lonnie Frisbee. And I wonder if Lonnie could just share with us some now. Well, the people tell me that I'm trying to look like Jesus. I can't think of anybody else I'd rather look like. <laughs> okay, pause. Has Jesus actually ever stopped for a moment and posed for a painting? Did he ever do that? How do they know what Jesus looked like? Last time I checked it was the Roman Catholic Church worshipping their false idols and false images of Christ. The Bible has never described how he looks. Jesus, he changed my life and I, I kind of relate it to like David the psalmist when he says that thou hast lifted me up from the dunghill and he has placed my feet on a solid rock and Jesus has lifted me up out of a horrible pit and he's washed my my heart from all the sins and all of the, the evil that I had gotten myself into and since then I'm all cleaned up now <laughs> and Isn't that a wonderful feeling? Yeah <laughs> And only Jesus could have done it that's right. And so... It's thrilling. It sure is. <laughs> and so because these are the last days, God has chosen himself some prophets. And the church for so long has been expecting a certain mold of, of what a Christian should look like or what a Christian should be or what a Christian should say. And God is blowing everybody's mind <laughs> because he's saving, he's saving the the hippies and nobody thought a hippie could be saved <laughs> what I was saying is I've gotten to work on a, the privilege to work on a lot of films that I love but never ever have I experienced a day like that uh, we were doing the baptisms I remember Jonathan was out in the water doing the baptisms and and he came to me between takes and he's like man I'm doing it just like Greg taught me just like the, you know, we had like a baptism school. He's like, but people are really getting saved. These SAG extras and the other people that came in. That and it was, I've never felt anything like that before in my life. Like God was just there. Praise God. And so God. I hope that happens when people see the movie. Lonnie was into Timothy Leary and he mixed a lot of the stuff he got involved in in regard to the occult with his Christianity. And where that ends and where that ever stops, it's hard to know. Timothy Leary was a follower of the Satanist Lester Crowley. Frisbee says in his autobiography, not by miter, by power, he says, I was chopping acid on the weekends and having all kinds of hallucinations. I got involved in a drug cult in Laguna Beach called Mystic Arts, which was part of the widespread organization of psychedelic acid heads under Timothy Leary and the Brotherhood. We dealt LSD to other high school kids and 
junior high kids. So it's interesting, Chad, long before Lonnie was hailed as this Christian evangelist, he was already an evangelist under occult power, uh, connected to Timothy Leary, and he was actually leading people by the hundreds, he said, to take LSD and various drugs. When I first turned on the drugs, I thought that was the truth, so I turned everybody on the drugs. When I first turned on the drugs, I thought that was the truth, so I turned everybody on the drugs. I'd like him to come up and share right now. Brother Lonnie, when you come on up, brother. Amen. Let's give him a big set for you, yeah. This is Father Lonnie. This is Father Lonnie. Father Lonnie? You mean like a Catholic father? A priest? And uh, we are men of God, and uh, this brother, like I says, is just, I've just laughed and cried and just uh, really enjoyed some sweet fellowship. Let's say that in the last days, they shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies. Amen. And I was also overcome by the drug cocaine. And I'm not giving any dates, because I'm not stupid. <laughs> but the Lord has gloriously delivered me from cocaine. You know, it was such an upwardly mobile drug. So acceptable among doctors, dentists, and the clergy. But you see, the Lord's bringing down some things. He's bringing down some things today. So. Promotion comes not from the east nor from the west. Come on. For the Lord raises up one and he puts down another. Yeah. Put yourself, imagine yourself to be a leper. And then all of a sudden there's food and drink and clothes and warmth. And then it's like this. Uh, he states that uh, his involvement entailed passing out LSD to a bunch of people. Uh, as far as what he was trying to do to get the message out that LSD is how you find God. I think he was very confused, and a lot of the questions is whether he, whether he was a purposeful deceiver. I personally lean toward and I hope that he was, about, Paul talks about those who are deceiving and being deceived. I think on some level, uh, he was trying to mesh the two together. The Mystic Arts World was the group that was basically opened up by Timothy Leary, okay? And this is important to understand. This was the biggest drug cartel in the United States of America. They worked with the Hells Angels. They worked with others to get acid, LSD, other drugs throughout the, throughout the United States to promote this, this Crowleyan doctrine of opening yourself up to the demonic world through hallucinogens and so forth. In fact, the mystic arts world was known for their especially potent LSD that would just really trip you out and open you up to these entities. And it was called Orange Sunshine. So Joe, we're seeing all this. We're seeing him talk about, you know, doing these very things when he was obviously a non-believer. But there, is there any evidence that he was actually still doing some of these things like LSD and so forth? Was he actually doing them and yet claiming to be born again as well? Oh, he was claiming to be a Christian evangelist. He was going uh, evangelizing uh, people and he would give them drugs. He'd give them LSD uh, and then he would claim to be fallen Christ and then he would be on LSD and then he would baptize them while they were all on LSD, not repenting of their, I mean, very, very illicit drug use and hippie ways as the Crowleyanism was being mixed with Christianity. So we drove out to Talkwitz Falls and we hiked up. He wanted to go to the very top fall. And once we got there, he, he opened his backpack and he spread out and he had LSD and he had marijuana and he had all of his oil paints and he proceeded to paint a picture of Jesus on the rock, a full-sized picture of Jesus on the rock. Then he pulled out his Bible and he got kind of in a yoga position and he says, we're going to read the Bible now. He was reading about John the Baptist and how John the Baptist baptized. And he baptized us up at Talkwitz Falls, even though we were all on drugs, even though we were all on drugs. Lonnie was only in the little chapel. By the time Calvary moved to the tent because it couldn't contain all the people, Lonnie was gone. Wow. And he had moved off to Florida because he wanted to work in his marriage. And that's reflected in the film. We show that yep. Lonnie had his struggles. Yep. We show Lonnie was flawed. We Everyone in this film is flawed. Yeah. You know, we're just showing how God did extraordinary things in the lives of ordinary people. Yeah. And and so Lonnie left in short order. I mean, I my tenure there with Lonnie was around a year and a half 
I think at the most, and he was gone. Yeah. So we. So the whole movie is kind of is is, is that year and a half, Pretty two much. year window yeah. of you coming to faith and, yes. and, and everything that happened yeah. that kind of sparked this movement. Yeah. And so the theme of God using flawed people, yes, right, uh, that was strong and beautiful, and all these different things. And, and I'm sure people at this point probably know how Lonnie's story, you know, kind of went off the rails yeah. in the '80s and. All the stuff that happened. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, Let's if, if you're okay. So, sure. so what do you make of all of that? Like the the yeah. the divorce, and then him kind of pulling away from everybody, and then the homosexuality, mm -hmm. and then the AIDS, and then it seems like he reconciled with everybody towards yeah. the end. What did you make of all? I mean, that's a, I know I just asked you about a whole decade of time. Yeah, well, um, I think it's important to talk about this because Lonnie, you know, left Calvary. Mm -hmm. He went off to Florida. I kind of lost touch with him mm -hmm. for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I heard about what happened. So I would say Lonnie fell away spiritually. Okay. Wow. I, would, I mean, it clearly was backsliding. Okay. And in his own books that he's written about his life, he talks about how he was up partying. He started using drugs mm -hmm. and he was living immorally. I don't know the specifics of his immorality, mm -hmm. if it involved homosexual encounters. Uh, you know, actually in the film early on when... When before he was a Christian, when Chuck first meets Lonnie, Lonnie says to Chuck, back in Haight Asbury, we did everyone and everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then this is something that happened later. His marriage fell apart. I don't know the details of that. He fell away and he got involved with the vineyard. Mm -hmm. And uh then it came out what he had been doing. And so he kind of kept re-emerging here and there, but not really seeming to get traction. And then ultimately he gets AIDS. Mm. So I hear Lonnie is dying of AIDS. So he was in hospice care in Newport Beach. And this I is early 90s? Yes. Yeah. So we were already doing our crusades at this point. Yeah. 90s? Yes. Yeah. So we were already doing our crusades at this point. Yeah. We were doing our crusades at this point. Why would Greg Laurie use such terms in his speech? I don't think I need to explain by whom the crusades were started. And why, if we check Laurie's Wikipedia page, it says that he was the founder of Harvest Crusades, a so-called evangelical Christian organization. And Lonnie had prophesied over me when I was a young man, and this is in the film. Yep. So we were praying for some people. I was kind of hanging around with him for a few months after my conversion. He was praying for some people, and I was just standing there to the side, and he turns to me and he says, the Lord just told me you're going to preach to thousands of people mm. around the world. I'm like dumbfounded. I hadn't even <laughs> preached a single sermon. Yep. I mean, I drew a cartoon booklet. That yep. was my... Tonight I have the director of that film, Academy Award winning director and actor. Let's welcome Mel Gibson to the Harvest Crusade. But this film in particular, The Passion of the Christ, you know, as I said, it, it's sort of like going back in time. I felt like I went into a time machine and almost was seeing it. And, you know, there's some moments that are very graphic. But as you've said in interviews, uh, maybe your film, as is, is realistic as it is, isn't as graphic as it actually was the scourging, the whipping, the crucifixion itself. But why did you make this film? Well, I think um, there's a tendency for all of us uh, to take that event yeah. and the extent of the sacrifice, take it for granted. Yeah. And filmically particularly, cinematically, I think it's been sanitized a fair bit right. so that it becomes, I don't know, ineffective, ineffectual, not emotional. Yeah. And I wanted to illustrate the extent of, of the sacrifice yes. that Christ made. So I felt that to do a film like that and my own experience contemplating over the years on the passion uh, my imagination soared, and there are readings on the on the matter that kind yeah. of brought home the dreadful reality yeah. of how bad the uh, how bad it was. Why, in the Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson showed this alleged Jesus, a Catholic Jesus, having his right eye darkened? It was never mentioned in Scripture that Jesus had a black eye, but you know who has his right eye darkened? The false shepherd, the Antichrist. The upcoming Antichrist will be a one-eyed ruler, and if you look at this picture of Mel Gibson that I'll put on screen, well, 
Do I need to say more about this great man fighting the evil system of Satan? Some of you should be ashamed calling me all kinds of names just because you idolize and worship your Hollywood millionaires who don't care about you at all. Actors making millions of dollars all of a sudden want to expose their own industry? The hand that feeds them? Were you born yesterday? Or are you that gullible? That's right. And, um, it's, it's right. Well, it's a gift to be with you today. Um, nice I to had, see you. Thank you. I had um, the great privilege of watching Father Stu. Oh, and we all he keep hearing um, about the redemption that's wrapped up into that movie. But it's so much more about not just Father Stu, but the people in his life. And I loved watching the, the rawness and the brokenness of the father-son dynamics that were happening. Sure. And when you, the scenes when you're lifting him up off the ground, two in particular, really, really moved me. Yeah, it's so, it's so fascinating to me, the power of stories, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is like the great storyteller. When he wanted to talk about the deep truths of life, sure. what did he do? He told stories, parables, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. And so it's so such part of our Catholic tradition, the power of, of storytelling. And I think you have done such a uh, tremendous work about sh showing that we could be Catholics, um, yeah. engaged in this industry, and do it really well. Like that's why when I look back at Father Stu, it's not only that the video has all these amazing themes, mm -hmm. but it's produced beautifully, right? Like, so is is it possible? Like, is it possible that Catholics we could we could do it? Like, we could be good storytellers. We could work in the industry, and and we could create beauty. Of course, and, that, and that's where it comes from. I'm look at a Caravaggio. I mean, firstly, he 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 was a very flawed man. He was like uh, uh, the mostly the only thing we know about Caravaggio is, for example, his prison records. He was always being arrested or getting in brawls or fights, and he had some pretty. He, he was he was pretty rough trade. But look at the art, and and look at the themes, you know, and and those paintings almost move when you look at them, you know? And um, he told a story with every picture. And, and we're kind of like the modern Caravaggio's, you know, we have cinematic images. In fact, when I did The Passion, it was like, I said to the DP, I said, I want a Caravaggio that moves. And we had some uh, cinematographer called Caleb Deschanel, who is like, he's, you know, d you know, top notch. I was watching dailies and I was like, wow. I said, it's a moving Caravaggio. And he said, he just tossed it off. He said, well, that's what you wanted, isn't it? I said, well, yeah, but like you, you I couldn't get over it, you know? So, you know, these things, uh, I, I don't think, uh, I think actually um, being a Catholic actually uh, uh, suits uh, storytelling better mm -hmm. because I mean, that's, that's, that's what we live on. We have to go back. We have to remember, we have to um, engage with the greatest story ever told kind of thing. So it's a, um, a pretty easy, I mean, w there's nothing that should inhibit great storytelling or even in this industry. I mean, some people, they have this idea that they, um, they have to compromise who they are by, um, you know, being in the, in the world of film. Well, you don't, I mean, you can, but um, not necessary. I'm quite close with Mel Gibson. And when I, I didn't know how to get to Latin Mass, I didn't know how to find it. You can't like go type it up online and find it. And he had, he had uh, introduced me to certain Latin Mass, which, um, uh, cause he's very into that traditionalist thing. Cause he's very into that traditionalist thing. <sighs> I won't dance, don't ask me. I won't dance, don't ask me. Some of you mentioned in the previous video that Mel Gibson was feminized in the movie called What Women Want. There's no secret that Hollywood does that to all male actors. So I thought I might include this clip just to remind you that there's a price to pay and that Mel Gibson chose to obey. He chose to play this role and to stay in this filthy environment when he simply could have walked away long time ago. And know oh, what you do to me. Okay, okay, I gotta think like a broad. All right, I'm a broad. I see lipstick mm, on a dark haired Tahitian beauty standing under a waterfall wearing nothing but a thong, water cascading down her back. I'm a lesbian. I, I 
I gotta change the music. Yes, got mm, Nice thick lash. Oh, 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 shit, that stings. What the f? We have the hell right leg. Uh, yes, and uh, the hot. Hot wax. Not very hot wax. We go. Oh! oh. Jeez. Honey, you just lost yourself five pounds. <laughs> All right, where's my wonder bra? Oh, now yeah, let's <gasps> see which end is up here. Hi! What are you doing? Exfoliating. Yo. You must be, um... Cameron, my boyfriend. This is Nick. Uh, her father. That's nice nail polish. <laughs> There. Yeah, I'm just doing a new research thing at work, you know, uh, trying to get into the female psyche and whatever. Yeah. And then you said, you know, we're going to be bringing out the resurrection, right? Yep. Now, that was 2016. Uh -huh. Is it coming soon? Yeah, sooner now. Because it, what I had to, it, it is such a massive uh, undertaking um, that you can't do it lightly and you can't do it quickly. You have to really consider what it is that you need to show in order to be poignant. It can't be linear. It has to, you have to have many things to juxtapose against one another, even from different time periods, in order to illustrate what something means in a more full way. And I think um, it's gonna be a real jigsaw puzzle to do. And I have two scripts, right. and, and one of them is very structured and a very strong script, and kind of more what you'd expect, and the other is like an acid trip and because you're going into other realms and stuff okay i mean you're in hell you're in you know you're it's it's like you know it is, you're watching the angels fall oh you know, wow. it's like crazy you know, is crazy. jim gonna come back as jesus yeah of course he's 17 years older does yeah. he how does that work i don't know it's gonna be a rip van winkle kind of thing you know <laughs> three days later look he's got wrinkles Lonnie did play a key role in the last great spiritual awakening in America. Lonnie messed up. Mm. Lonnie fell away. Lonnie returned to the Lord. Lonnie was forgiven. Yeah, that's good. But as he began to speak, I sort of saw that old Lonnie spark still. Mm. And Lonnie believed that God was going to heal him. Wow. And he believed he was going to preach. Mm. But I think Mike and I could see this was not going to happen. And I don't know if that was the effects of the AIDS, if he was delusional, but but it was clear. But he was repentant. He knew what he did yeah. was wrong. Yeah. He never was an advocate for yeah. any of it, yeah. but he fell away. So, okay, th that may trouble some people. Why are you making a movie about Lonnie Frisbee? It's not a movie about Lonnie Frisbee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a movie about the Jesus movement. Yeah. Lonnie Frisbee played a role. To not put him in there is to edit history. Yep. Chuck Smith played a role. It shows how I came to faith, Kathy came to faith during that time. So, hello, welcome to life. Mm -hmm. God uses flawed people. Yeah. What about the story of Samson? Mm -hmm. What about the story of Noah? Mm -hmm. After he, you know, bringing the ark safely to land, he goes and deliberately gets drunk and uncovers himself. And he goes and deliberately gets drunk and uncovers himself. What about Gideon? Yeah. What about, and the list goes on. It's interesting what he said about Noah. That's what Michael Pearl wrote in his satanic comic book as well, indicating that Noah was a drunkard. Take a look. Here we have Noah. Noah became a farmer and planted grapes. That's not what the Bible says. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, the new world was lonely with just four families, but soon his sons were having children of their own. Noah discovered, look at this. I mean, this, is, this is blasphemy right here. This is satanic. Noah discovered that by putting fruit in a container and leaving it for a few weeks, it made an alcoholic drink that caused him to feel funny. Noah got to liking the drink so much that at times he couldn't work. He would just fall down unconscious. It made him do things that displeased God. What? <laughs> Excuse me? Genesis chapter 9 in the Bible not some satanic comic book. 
Genesis chapter 9, verse 20, And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Okay. Does it say anything at all about he he learned how to make wine alcoholic and it, he liked the drink and it would you know he just you know he started to do things that displeased God? It doesn't say that. I believe in context here. What happened is the atmospheric change of the world after the flood. All of a sudden, that grape juice that would not have fermented back in the first you know the way that it was before the flood. Now all of a sudden he's like, whoa, this thing makes him drunk and he's going. You know, he didn't try this on purpose. How do you know that? <clears throat> Verse 24, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And it goes down through here. And, uh, well, let me, I, I need to read it. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Um, so you mean to tell me, up here, Noah is, is, is in sin, okay, according to Michael Pearl, He's in sin. He got drunk on purpose. But here, as soon as he wakes up from his wine, God's speaking prophecy through him? No, it was a mistake that Noah made. He wasn't getting drunk on purpose. And to put that into a comic book, that's blasphemy. Because Noah spoke prophecy as soon as he woke up from that wine. Now, if he did it on purpose, if he knew how to get drunk and he was getting drunk on purpose, like this stupid comic book says, you know, I mean, I don't understand why a Bible believer would even write a thing like this. But if this, if this is the truth here, this picture here, I'll show it again. You know, he knew, he knew how to get drunk. According to Michael Pearl's comic book here, he knows how to get drunk and he wakes up and God goes, Oh, you know, down here it says he's displeasing God, but God speaks prophecy through a guy that's displeasing him. That's a bunch of junk right there. And I'll tell you what, you start messing with the Word of God, you start adding to and subtracting from it and things like that, you're playing with fire. You're playing with serious, serious fire. So, I wasn't going to go watch Jesus Revolution because I'm in the habit of not watching most Christian films. Then my friend John McCrae, what do you mean, posted a video about it. John has terrible taste in movies, music, and friends, so his endorsement of a film would normally be a good reason not to watch it. Lots of people have been asking me about the new movie, Jesus Revolution, and wanted to hear my thoughts on it. And since it's a major motion picture about Christianity, I went to go see it this weekend, and man, do I got a lot to say about this one. We might be shocked at just how much God can work through us in order to bring countless people to him, as he did through Chuck during the time of the Jesus Revolution. So, if you choose to watch this movie, then I would challenge you to think about what a radical Jesus Revolution would look like today. Who might we have a tendency to look at as out outsiders and sinners, and what would it look like to show Christ to them while recognizing that we're no more deserving of salvation than they are. But a bunch of people in the comments said they liked it, so my wife and I headed to the theater. So should you go see Jesus Revolution while it's still in theaters? You can, of course, always see it some other way later, but there's one more consideration here. Hollywood production companies are always paying close attention to who shows up to the movie theaters. If you'd like to see more Christian films, you can actually send a message by what you watch. Now, you don't want to go see bad Christian movies just because they're Christian movies. That sends the wrong message. That sends the message that Christians will watch garbage as long as it's got something to do with Jesus. So you don't want to go see bad Christian movies. But if a Christian film is worth watching, Christians should go watch it and Jesus' revolution is worth watching. Why would a Trinitarian David Wood who attended Fordham University, a Jesuit university, the same university that Trump went to, like and actually recommend seeing the Jesus' revolution movie? And why would a Catholic endorse David Wood by saying that David has made highly effective short videos that set the record straight on areas of Christian Muslim disagreement? Could the papacy be involved in making this film? I think you know the answer. What might say that you're in some peril of uh, stereotyping yourself? In what way? Well, 
This guy looks a lot like Jesus. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, what? In fact, I mean, it's as you know, it's a line from the film. People say I look yeah. like Jesus, and I tell them there's no other, nobody else I'd rather look like. So, and I the would, fact that he actually, yeah. you know, performed the miracles that that people write write about and that that are written about in this book that you know people had seen him perform like healed blindness and, and wow all sorts of like they said like this one one guy that came out of calvary that was dear friends with lonnie at that time that the movie takes place he said it was like walking with an apostle like it just you just it was not like nothing like no other experience he's ever had in his life there is a lot of things about lonnie's life that did not make it into the film um, why do you think they chose to focus on the things they that they did and not to go into all the other areas? Because it wasn't a film about Lonnie. It was a film about this movement. And this movement wasn't just about Lonnie. It was about Chuck Smith. This story was about Greg Laurie's, you know, coming of age spiritually. Um, so it was the intersection of these, these uh, personalities, which is what created this explosion of faith specifically chuck and lonnie their 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 coming together was like nitro meets glycerin and um and 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 that set this movement on fire i mean christ appeared to lonnie in a vision that told him before he ever met chuck smith that he was going to bring thousands of hippies to himself to christ and and he looked out over you know, he looked out in this vision at the Pacific Ocean, and instead of being filled with water, it was filled with people, with with hippies just yearning for, for God. And that's exactly what he did. What Jonathan is saying reminds me of that whole Asbury revival nonsense we saw a few months ago. And it's very easy to debunk this whole revival thing. Just ask yourselves this simple question. When was the last time when real Christianity was promoted on Satan's mainstream platforms? There you go. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. A true repentant biblical revival in the end times? No, I don't think so. Rather a falling away and giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, as cat, I mean, I know as a Catholic myself, um, I don't know a lot about this. I had never heard of Lonnie Frisbee or yeah. Chuck Smith or Greg Laurie. Mm -hmm. And I'm vaguely familiar with the evangelical world, more so because of the film, especially that Kingdom has been doing. Yeah. But it's another world. Yeah. And so what was it like for you to just suddenly become immersed in this? It's also a Christian world, mm -hmm. but it's a completely different Christian yeah. world than Catholics are used to. Yeah. Well, I think I think my introduction to this uh, ecumenical sense of uh, uh, fraternity uh, happened began with uh, the chosen, because mm -hmm. you know Dallas Jenkins is an evangelical Christian. Um, you know, there's a, a bunch of um, a variety of denominations working on that series, and when you work with each other, when you talk to each other, um, the thing that we all have in common is that we love Jesus. And, you know, that's that's who we want to praise and worship. This double speech that they're using, I hate it so much. What they're saying here, without actually saying it, is that Roman Catholicism, the great whore Mystery Babylon, should bring back her harlot daughters under her wing again. Because, after all, we all worship the same Jesus, but Catholic Jesus is not the same. They have to crucify him and eat his flesh in a form of a wafer each week for salvation. And I mean most Protestants have compromised and went with the world. They all have their spiritual dead and mortgaged church buildings that went along with the lockdowns. I mean you know the whole deal. Look like the lost to win the lost. I say have a personal relationship with the Lord and his perfect word King James Bible. Don't compromise like these people that are spiritually fornicating with Mystery Babylon. And uh, and so, I mean, they're, they're brothers and sisters that are separated from us, right? Um, denominationally, but we're still all part of the same body of Christ. So I think uh, it's, it's important to have these dialogues. It's important to be able to relate to each other. 
on uh, on this level and 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 foster discussion and learn from each other. There's so much that we have to learn from each other. In poking around about Lonnie Frisbee, I discovered that his funeral was mm-hmm. held at Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California, yeah. which is now a Catholic cathedral. It's ironic. Yeah. Isn't it? So yeah. interesting. He was a big fan. Lonnie was a fan of St. Francis. When he started preaching, he would... I could walk. see that. Mm-hmm. He had a walking stick. He had a leather mantle. Uh, he probably was barefoot for a lot of the time. And uh, and he carried a, a bag slung around him uh, in which he had a bottle of um, olive oil that was stuffed with pieces of cinnamon and frankincense. And he would anoint people, you know. Like oh, wow. Was, anoint people in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And and uh, and so he had talked about like being a, a, a fan of St. Francis. So um, before I started work, I went over to Christ Cathedral and uh, I, I sat by his grave and I prayed a rosary with him. Uh, I, I sat by his grave and I prayed a rosary with him. Oh, he didn't realize he's buried there too. He's, oh yeah, he's buried there. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to have to go take a look at that. Yeah, it's 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 powerful in fact i sat down and i prayed with him um the the space just to his right is empty so i got to sit down or lie at one point i even lied down because i just thought it would be kind of interesting to try to connect in some way that's probably more information than you need or may even want to publish but that said uh i you know i it's the, the truth and so i finished praying with him and i said lonnie I want to honor you with this film. But Jonathan, if there's one thing I suspect you've heard from other people, um, it's your style of presenting Jesus in a way that is so gentle, so winsome, so subtle, so understated, and yet so intensely relatable. You don't just want to convert. You want to enter into a deep relationship, a close friendship with Jesus because he is, he's, there's humor, there's irony, there's understatement, there's just a winsomeness that you're like, could he have been that way? <laughs> of course, how else would he have been? <laughs> so it's like, yeah. ding, 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 you got a 10, Jonathan. And uh, well, so thanks. grateful because you, 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 you create this desire, you evoke a response of like, if that's what Jesus was like and still is, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is something I want perhaps more than anything else. And uh, wow, I mean, again, the gifts of God converge in a way that is semi-spectacular. And here you are getting ready for season two. And I'm sure <laughs> I'm putting pressure on, but you already uh, <laughs> you already have the grace. And so after I, I, I sort of had this reversion, it was about two years ago, or a deeper conversion is more accurate. Although I, I'm very fond of the, the moniker born again Catholic is always a fun one for me. So I'm like, oh yeah, that's, I, yeah, I, I'm sort of reborn of the spirit in a way. So for, as Catholics, we would say it more or less a, a deeper conversion. Um, Those of you who are watching this channel and are genuinely born again, do you see how they want to imitate us? It's so weird, isn't it? Just like Satan trying to copycat everything that the Lord does. They want that power, but since they don't have it, they try to imitate it by saying the right words. Planning for me since I'm very, very young, since I'm at least uh, the earliest that I can sort of point to um, is, is being 10 or 12 years old after being so impacted by watching Jesus of Nazareth, you know, the, the miniseries um, that, that became world famous for for decades and um and after watching you know jesus's walk to golgotha carrying his cross i literally went outside built my own life-size crucifix hammered the nails painted the blood and did my own via dolorosa in my backyard up through the crucifixion you know and and i and i had that memory like surface a few years ago as i was performing the passion as an adult in, in, in my local church and i said whoa this is this is trippy you know like is this what god has been planning for me all along and my interest in the arts i mean that's and, more than a coincidence that's more than a throwback yeah. that really is a kind of preparation yeah in the normal world that's called being absolutely insane in the head um, but that's beautiful quick little token of gratitude to Miss Kimberly Jones 
uh, she sent me a couple of these stunning rosaries. That's Chosen Season 2 Rosary. Rosaries by Kimberly L.E.E. And then for all of you fans of Divine Mercy, this is a special Divine Mercy Rosary that she made. Um, there's St. Faustina, and there's Jesus. And uh, just a reminder, the rosaries were always praying to Jesus, meditating on the life of Jesus, his life, death, resurrection, events in his life. It's all about Jesus, all about Jesus, before any of you like, wait a second, the rosary, you! Ah! No, it's about Jesus. Okay. Oh, what I didn't, what I didn't mention before, so many of you know Scully. A lot of you that don't know me are freaked out by Scully. No need, no point, no point, no point. Nothing to be afraid of or worried about. Uh, I found a very, uh, a, 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 an exciting and interesting video by a, uh, a pastor who, a pastor who uh, spent, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes um, tearing me down, uh, mostly because of this guy uh, and uh, his uh, suspecting that I'm probably Masonic. And then I think he actually came around to what it actually is. I think he actually got it right. I'm not a Mason. Um, uh, this is a symbol of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a medieval tradition, Catholic tradition called Memento Mori, which means remember your death, remember that you will die. Uh, many saints, uh, it was a common practice for saints and holy people and, and uh, philosophers and thinkers to have a skull on their desk. Um, one of my friends and daughters of St. Paul, uh, Sister Alethea, as a whole uh, description, Pursued by Truth is her handle, at Pursued by Truth. Uh, I think I got that right. About what Memento Mori is, the history of it, what it means, and why focus on your death? Why focus on your death? Is it morbid? Is it uh, demonic? Is it no? It doesn't. No, it doesn't have to be. It is if you make it that way. If you insist, well, that's that's up to you, man. But that's not a, what it means to me. So this, through the Catholic tradition, is about focusing on your death, so that you may procure a more holy life, so that you may prepare your life in a way that is more Christ-like. And so, um, just before Caleb Fan Awards, Scully got a brother. Yeah, that's his brother, Maury, in it. Yeah, that's right, younger brother, sound a bit older. Hey, how are you? How you been? Uh, you know, hey, what do you think? Is it good? Right, hey, hey, good. Right, Scully, Maury, and Mary. That's Mary there. Our Lady of Guadalupe. So, dynamic duo, yeah? In a way. Cool. So that's that. But it's the real location. My favorite in the movie was when Lonnie baptizes Greg, the prayer that they pray and the way that it happens. Greg actually wrote that. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Like that wasn't in the script. It was just sort of the saying this happened. I ask you to come into my life. I repent from my sins. And I repent from all my sins. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior, my God and friend. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior, my God and my friend. There's just a level of authenticity and accuracy and heart uh, that he added because he's been a pastor for over 40 years. And uh, spirituality was in the air when we were filming at Pirate's Cove and random extras were making real, you know, professions of faith in a way that I've never really been a part of in my entire career. How many baptisms a week? We're doing hundreds a week, sometimes even close to a thousand. It's, it's remarkable. The Lord is doing some amazing work here. The other question, the outfit in the post, the advertisement. Um, what is that from? Uh, a couple of people mentioned some stuff. So in that outfit, let me see if I can bring it up here. That was the ad. I'm wearing a mantle and a cross with a little crown on it. That is called uh, a Knight's Cross. Uh, five years ago, I was uh, knighted by the order, the uh, solemn uh, sovereign military order of the Temple of Jerusalem. I lost my mind there for a second. Um, essentially, the Knights Templar, 
which is what that is, are a, an ecumenical charitable organization. They're officially an NGO, a non-governmental organization recognized by the United Nations. So Jonathan Rumi is officially a Knights Templar. How about that? But yet he says that he's not a Mason, as if Knights Templars were somehow better than Masons. A Knights Templar portraying Jesus? That's very interesting. By the United Nations that do charitable work for, uh, especially uh, in, on behalf of Christians uh, and many persecuted Christians around the world. Um, I have a heart for persecuted Christians as well. Um, being Especially from the Middle East, it is very tough to be Christian in the Middle East. I know a lot of people close to me that were persecuted growing up in the Middle East because they were Christian. Um, and so the Knights Templar uh, are a phenomenal organization that um, do good works they, uh, on behalf of those people and on behalf of refugees and they do missions, they fly aid over to uh, all parts of the world, obviously with COVID that had been suspended, but they um, are a phenomenal organization, uh, many uh, military based and backed and, and, um, and oriented uh, uh, folks, men and women. Uh, many uh, military-based, backed, and and um, and oriented uh, uh, folks, men and women, dames and knights uh, combined, that make up this uh, tremendous voluntary charity, non-governmental, you know, organization that essentially helps people. So, um, and they asked me to to join their ranks uh, two years ago. Um, in addition. In the last year or so, um, some of you who were at the Young Catholic Professionals Conference, which I spoke at at the end of April, um, may have heard that I also had been honored to begin the process of being inducted as a papal knight, which is basically a, an order of knighthood recognized by the Pope himself. Honored to begin the process of being inducted as a papal knight, which is basically a, an order of knighthood recognized by the Pope himself. Um, yeah, so um, that will be cool if that, you know, when that actually commences into the knighthood, um, especially since I'm going to meet him this summer and maybe Dallas too. Would you like to join us in Rome to watch me meet the Pope? Let me know in the comments ahead. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. There was a uh, there's a show uh, called The Chosen. You heard of that? No. And it's about uh, the life of uh, it's about Jesus, about the life of Christ, and uh, the guys that I met the guys that like did this. They were they're they're, they're I, this studio I believe was behind. They do you know dry bar comedy, like no. those clean. It was like on face the ones that is all clean. And they've been on Facebook, but this chosen's that they made is got it's like through the roof. How many people have watched this show? What is it about? Uh, Christ and it was uh, Jesus. I think it's through the perspective of the the people. Is, you know, most things are through Jesus' perspective, and this is through the uh, like people that are around theirs perspective. I don't know a ton. I've only seen, I've only seen like a little. I haven't got to watch the whole thing, but it's got it. The views of it. It was. I think you can buy it Holy on Amazon shit. now. But they the just views. made their own app, and so they just went and they made an app called The Chosen, and you went to that app and you watched that show, and I believe it got. I mean, millions upon millions of views. I'm not here to be sentimental and soothing. I'm here to start a revolution. Well, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That isn't exactly... I said revolution, not revolt. I'm talking about a radical shift. All right, apparently I am meeting the Pope in just a little bit. I get to sit in this special section in the front. Jonathan is currently in the bathroom, and this is the general assembly so this is really fascinating for me as a protestant i don't have a whole lot of passion for something like this but it's certainly a, an, an amazing opportunity and represents the growth of this show around the world when we were in line 
people from all over the world were recognizing us and thanking us for the show. And uh, you're a big part of that. So the opportunity for other faith traditions to experience the show is not something that I necessarily planned for, uh, but it's, <laughs> I didn't think I'd, I'd become, uh, you know, have an opportunity here to, to meet the Pope and to get to experience this amazing city, Rome. But it's certainly quite an honor and something that represents just how far the Chosen is reaching. All right, we are not far from getting to meet the Pope. How do you feel? Better words have not been spoken. Yeah. But you are an actor who plays Jesus, right. so you should speak for so the I entire should, I should be. Catholic Church right, right let now. Me, let me do Much that. like I can speak for the entire evangelical population. We just walked out of St. Peter's Basilica, which genuinely is one of the top three most unbelievable pieces of art I've ever seen. I would consider yeah. the whole church to be an art piece of worship, really. I've never seen anything like it. You just walk around thinking you'll need a chiropractic appointment later because you're going <laughs> to crane your neck. It is different in there for you than it is for me. Because for me, you'll have moments where you'll touch something or you'll kiss something or, or you'll have a moment where it means more to you. Dio vi benedica. Actor Jonathan Rumi and director Dallas Jenkins were among the crowd at the Pope's general audience in Paul VI Hall. Rumi plays Jesus Christ in The Chosen, a multi-season TV series directed by Jenkins. When it was their turn to greet the Pope, Rumi asked Pope Francis to bless some rosaries. Then the actor assured him of his prayers. A smile materialized on the Pope's face when Rumi told him of his role as Jesus in The Chosen. That isn't exactly... I said revolution, not revolt. I'm talking about a radical shift. Then the series director Dallas Jenkins introduced himself, and the Pope couldn't hold back his sense of humor. Jesus? No, 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 no. But I am Protestant, but I am making a show for everyone who loves Jesus. But, and I've grown to over the years, like when I first used to come to these places, I would, I would show up and I'd be like, this feels wrong to me. Mm. And now that I know so many more uh, Catholic brothers and sisters who I believe share the same passion for Jesus that I do and just uh, have a different worship approach and style, I go, okay, I, I can see, I see, I do see it differently. So this is really fascinating for me as a Protestant. And I think, I think as a Catholic, it is holy. I think the, the bones of Peter, I haven't seen them yet. I think they, they are holy because they were in him. They were in a man, they were part of a man that lived on the earth and did phenomenal, extraordinary things and was essentially um, given the keys to the church, to start the church. Like they were doing a mass when I came in. What takes place in that church that when you walk in is, is meaningful to you and connective to you? When you're going into a place like St. Peter's, you can't help but just be stupefied at the beauty of the artistry and the thought of, of how long it took to actually build this cathedral. And so you have to get past that to find those moments of personal connection. So for me, participating in the Mass is what brings makes it extremely personal for me. You kind of have to put blinders on and you have to just sort of find those things that have resonance. Like Pope St. John Paul II is buried in, in the uh, Basilica. There's an altar and he's inside the, the altar and many, many popes are buried inside there. And because he was a pope that I grew up with as a kid, seeing him on TV, hearing him preach, that then becomes the personal connection for me. He just meant a lot to me personally. And so that's when I come into a place like this, that's how I can connect on a personal level. I think it's made to really highlight how much of the culture at the time was centered around God in society and the efforts that they took to glorify God through the gifts that they were given. Let's sh show God the magnitude of our love for him and, and, and by building these, these magnificent monuments. Around the time when the first episode of Chosen showed up, Jonathan Rumi was knighted as a Templar so the Pope knew that a Knights Templar would portray Jesus in the Chosen, and I think that's significant.
and I'm learning from the great artists of all time, and Michelangelo, and you know, I mean, gosh, I was gonna, I was gonna say Michelangelo because I thought of his sculpture, and then I was gonna say, and the guy who did the Sistine Chapel, and that was Michelangelo. <laughs> I'm like, he got, he was. There are no popes, cathedrals, worship of bones of so-called dead saints, or worship of idols in the Bible. The director Dallas Jenkins should know better as a Protestant, but then again, as I said earlier, the mother of harlots is gathering her daughters under papal control. here to start a revolution. Well, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That isn't exactly... I said revolution, not revolt. I'm talking about a radical shift. I actually once read in a social media comment, and I, I rarely read them now because, well, let's be honest, if you really want to know what it's like playing Jesus, just read some of my, the comments on my pages, and it's like, I've got a skull ring, I'm a demon dweller, I mean, like, you know, I'm Masonic, I'm evil incarnate, I'm the Antichrist, I'm all sorts of stuff, so it's, it's uh, Jesus apparently uh, doesn't apply, uh, approve, rather, of the, the skull that's in your own head. Um, and uh, people don't know much about Memento Mori, so I try to just educate them on the value of um, understanding that life is fleeting and temporary. And this just reminds me that uh, all of this could be gone tomorrow, so why not focus on a holier life today? So that's my response to that. But in all seriousness, uh, I would love to share a little bit about my journey tonight, um, playing Christ in a very specific way. But starting with the, the two most frequent questions I get asked about this experience. Number one, what's it like to play Jesus? And number two, have you met Jim Caviezel from The Passion of the Christ? Get the second one out of the way. No, I have, I have not. I have not. I hear he's a wonderful man. Um, if I had a dollar for everyone that asked me that question, I would donate it all to St. Paul Center so they continue to promote life transforming scripture, study from the heart of the church. In the social media comments, I did read this that if Jim and I, if the film Jesus and the TV Jesus, Jim being the film Jesus, ever actually met in person, what was it? The universe might implode. <laughs> and since it hasn't happened, I'm starting to think the theory is maybe plausible. I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen if that happens. Just pray for me, please. But either way, I'll tell you one thing, I know where you were. Before we talk about Madison, I know you actually knew Pope John Paul II. You went to his funeral, didn't you? I did. I went to his funeral. Uh, I met with him twice while we were uh, filming, and uh, once afterwards. And uh, you know, when I, I came in and uh, met with him, it was pretty intimidating. Oh, wow. uh, just, what is it like to have a tad bit more audience? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I walked in, and uh, he first thing he said was. How are you? Yeah. Come here. Yeah. And I walked over and he says, Jim Caviezel, what have you learned to play Jesus Christ? And I said, well, Holy Father, you know, Jesus is a, 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 a 
uh, well, I, I, I like the Italian people, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he says, yes. Mm. And I said, uh, and, and they're very beautiful people. Yes. And yeah. I said, I think Jesus was Italian. He says, <laughs> what? <laughs> and I said, well, hold on. He, he didn't leave home until he was 30. <laughs> He always hang out with the same 12 guys. <laughs> and his That's mother believed he was God. <laughs> 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 he, then he says, he's, I said, you're not upset with me. He says, no, I always believed he was Polish. <laughs> I mean, everybody talks about him as being a wonderful man. Yes. And he seemed to have been a wonderful man. Everyone is talking about how great the Sound of Freedom movie was and how that Disney refused to release this film. Blah blah blah, all that charade, all that distraction. But if you actually look at which studio was behind the production and financing for the Sound of Freedom, then a big glowing light bulb should pop up in your head. Now, if you actually go to their website, Angel Studios, you will see that at the front page they're promoting the Sound of Freedom, and below they have an advertisement for The Chosen. Huh. What a coincidence, right? The Sound of Freedom is crushing at the box office right now, and it's surprising everyone since it's a faith-based film that even beat out Indiana Jones on its opening weekend. I saw the film last night, and my immediate reaction after watching the film was... Wow. I also find it funny that Jim Caviezel was at the QAnon rally where he recited Mel Gibson's Braveheart's battle cry. Will you fight? No! We will run! This man says no, we'll run and we'll live. Yep, fight and you may die. Run, and you'll live. For at least a while. And dying in your beds, many years from now. Would you have been willing to trade all the years from this day to that for one chance? Just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that you can take our lives, that you can never take our freedom. Every man dies. Not every man truly lives. You, 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 we must fight for that authentic freedom and live, my friends. By God, we must live. And with the Holy Spirit as your shield and Christ as your sword, may you join St. Michael and all the angels in defending God and sending Lucifer and his henchmen straight right back to hell where they belong. We are headed into the storm of all storms. Yes, the storm is upon us. But not without Jesus, our rudder. And in the words of Reagan, evil is powerless if the good are unafraid. God bless you. If I did not know what Jim is doing, I would be calling him a crazy lunatic. But he knows perfectly well what he's doing here, arousing the crowd. He's an actor acting his part after all. Maybe to an extent he even believes some of this nonsense that he's saying. The, uh, the QAnon stuff. Um, uh, Jim's QAnon. Well, let's look into that, because that could be really evil. Um, somewhere in Congress, they said QAnon is racist. Okay. Well, we don't like that, right? But so is the Ku Klux Klan. And that's another letter. It's a K. We don't like the letter Q. We don't like the letter K, but they don't go after the letter K. And I started looking into Senator Byrd, and, and he was a grand wizard. Hillary Clinton's tied to him. And Joe Biden's tied to him. Now, understand, this is a Ku Klux Klan there. And, and there is a lot of data that can prove that the Ku Klux Klan is an evil organization. And so are the Nazis. One could say that they're also racist, but they don't go after those. Only the QAnon. Now, if I, by way of analogy, About one if, I were, yep. if I were the Apostle uh, Saul, and I'm a Pharisee, 
I'm going to go after the Christians. I'm going to take them down. Now remove Christians and let's make it QAnon. I'm going to destroy them because the Romans told me they're evil. I'm going to destroy them because my own church staff, my Pharisee, fellow Pharisees said evil. I'm going to take them out. And then find, and then you find out it, it's not QAnon. It's Q and Anons. And Q puts out a question. And you're not allowed to ask questions anymore. Not allowed to. And the Anons, they look it all up. And, and they start looking and investigating this stuff. I never knew about them while I was doing this movie, Sound of Freedom. It has nothing to do with our film. But it's really interesting that they pointed to this immediately and said, that guy's one of them, he's bad. I'll tell you the rest after that. What do you think of Jim Caviezel's performance? He's a very great actor, but the silence, he's, I mean, when he's silent, you can, and he just tears up, it's... Break your heart. Yeah, it breaks my heart. I could feel the emotion from everything that he was witnessing and he was, like, putting himself into. Well, his performance is excellent. I want to introduce you to somebody. Hi. Oh, how you doing? Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> thank, thank you, you thank you very time. much for that for that movie because we got we got to help our children don't we yeah i know i yeah. know because uh, we are i'm also i'm also doing that deep. Why, why do you think audiences are responding that way i mean some of these people were in tears they didn't know what yeah. to expect and why do you think they're buying out theaters well i think that much the same way uh the it's a wonderful life i love all that you uh, all that you can take Oh, I can't remember the line, but anyway, I memorized it with Jimmy Stewart. But anyway, they um, they love their children. They love Raymond. I uh, that that scene right there with that lady made me cry once. Um, I, I don't know, man. I I just looked at it and I said, uh, this. Uh, I thought of my children. I thought um, I know that they're all watching right now. I thought it. Uh, everybody else's children. Well, I mean, I, I, I did, I, and I, I see your reaction. And this, to you, is not just a role. I mean, people don't realize this is a hundred and fifty billion dollar industry. More than ten million people are trafficked every year. Twenty-seven percent of those children. It's really bringing that cause to light as well. Yes, for you. Oh, absolutely. It's very emotional um, mm -hmm. seeing those um, people right there. Yeah. Um, well, and, the, and this, look, this subject matter is yeah. very hot, something Hollywood has not touched before. Yeah. And now there's this battle going on between Sound of Freedom and Disney's Indiana Jones. I'm going to read you. This is from Deadline. All industry eyes are watching the anomaly of this non-major studio independent title that has faith-based elements. Some pre-release projections had Sound of Freedom doing 11 million to 15 million dollars over six days, not one day. Jim, the film being shown in only 2,600 theaters compared to Indiana Jones, 4,600. It has made $14 million in one day. Indiana Jones made 11.7. What's going on here? Why is Disney fighting? They're saying the pre-sales shouldn't count, but they do count. You're the number one movie. Yeah. Well, it, this isn't about them. It's not about Angel Studios putting it out. It's about the children. Mm. And... Um, and Americans waking up right now. And the only way these laws are going to be changed is that if the people move right now to save them. This is a good versus evil story. This is a battled hero story. And I was very blessed that I got the opportunity, just as I was blessed to do The Passion of the Christ. And this is the best film I've done since that film. Mm. It is a controversial issue. It shouldn't be. We should just be naturally wanting to save our children. But again, there's those out there that want to exploit them. Yeah. It's curious to me that Disney had an opportunity to distribute this film when they bought 20th Century Fox. They let that go. And now Sound of Freedom has shown Indiana Jones the dial of destiny, which is pointing to extinction, I think. Raymond, we are not Disney's film. We are the people's film. Mm. Can we love our children? Can we love God's children more than we fear evil? That's the challenge here. And Americans are up to it. I love it. And they hear the sound of freedom because God's children are no longer for sale. <clears throat> the resurrection. Yeah. When does that start? Has it started? Yeah, oh, the writing, yes. Um, I know I, I asked him 
would you be willing, ready to go in January? He said, yeah, maybe. I said, how about the end of the fall? He goes, yeah, maybe. September? I said, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> He's so funny, because last time he did that, he, I said, okay, well, it won't be till January, and then all of a sudden I get the call, hey, you ready? <laughs> And we went, we went in September, October. So who knows? Um, I, I know he's working on that. Right now he's doing a movie with Wahlberg. Um, so he's finishing that, but he's been on this for a long, long time. And then it will be the biggest film in history. It might be two films. It could be three, but I think it's two. I can't wait. I cannot wait for that. I think it goes all the way to um, Planned Parenthood, the, the jugs of plastic containers. They use the uh, children. I think those go to the bio, bio labs. And I, I don't say, I, I should say that I know they do that. They send them to places like that all over the world. These bio labs, I think it's much, this is part of the whole business. What do they do with them in the bio labs when I they think, receive them? Well, um, either making the adrenochrome or they're using it to, um, from what I was told, um, is, is that and also for making agents to, you know, kill people with it. And during a certain part of the film, they were all talking in the audience. There was like five showings every single time, talking. So at the end of it all, I thanked them all for coming and then I said, why, during this part, you were talking. And they all yelled out, Epstein Island. And I said, now I understand why they don't want the, this to be seen. That's heavy. I'm not saying that there is no truth in his words, but you have to be able to see the bigger picture. And as I mentioned in my previous video, why would someone like Jim Caviezel or Mel Gibson expose Hollywood and put light on the child trafficking when they themselves are radical traditional Roman Catholics working in Hollywood? And let us point the obvious. Roman Catholicism being the biggest child molesting pedophile priest cult on earth why would Rome reports a Vatican-owned YouTube channel promote the sound of freedom? Like I said in the beginning, the serpent is willing to cut one of his evil heads to appear as someone righteous, as a false savior. Actor Jim Caviezel, most known for portraying Jesus in The Passion of the Christ, stars as the movie's lead. The movie, which premieres on July 4th, brings one man's story and the issue of child trafficking to light. Child trafficking it's a major, major problem. But there is also another problem. It's for good people to know about it and to do nothing about it. So all, all, all I ask is for people to come and enjoy the film. That's number one. And for me, I like to make movies that begin when the movie ends. And when the audience leaves the theater, it's just to feel moved enough to, to create awareness on this because awareness creates change. Alejandro says this film is meant to tell more than just a story. It is meant to encourage people to do what they can to combat child trafficking. One of the most disturbing problems in our world today is human trafficking, and particularly the trafficking of children. Now the first step in eradicating this crime is awareness. Go see Sound of Freedom. They're just so on fire about stuff and about God. And when they're in it, they're in it. And they're just pure and like nothing like That's why Jesus was so protective of them. It's like anybody mess with the kids, you're going to end up in a lake. The bottom with a weight around your neck. His words, not mine. David Lorenz lived a nightmare that took years to come to light. He was abused by a priest, a counselor at his Catholic high school, after a party on the last day of school. He was just 16. I, I, I spent the night in one of the bedrooms at his house, and that morning he came in and sodomized me. It was when he finally found the courage to tell someone that he discovered he was not alone. 
Others had previously accused the priest of attacks, but each time the church had covered up the crimes and moved him to a new parish and new victims. There is no organization, no company on earth, there is no government organization that says, if you abuse a child, you know what, we'll keep you on and we'll keep you under employment. The only organization in the entire world is the Catholic Church that says, if you're a pedophile, you can still remain a priest. Not only that, most of the time we'll hide you. Do you think this film is going to bring truth, but also educate kids, parents, on how this is happening, where it starts, and put the fear into people, into pedophiles and predators that are targeting these children? I don't know, I was reading this thing and I, I would absolutely say it's 100% the truth. They will never be able to walk down the street again. That's coming, without a doubt, and it will be a great day. It needs to be, this needs to be done. This is the, the worst time in the history of all humanity right now we're living in. Everybody on the show always gets a gift and usually it's a bag of Vigilance Elite gummy bears uh, from my company. But for you, I wanted to give you this rosary. Oh. And um, so I want to tell you about, I want to tell you about that rosary. When I found my faith, I got public about it. And a good friend of mine, his name's Dom Razo. Uh, we were together at SEAL Team 2, and then he went on to development group SEAL Team 6. And when he saw that I'd come out and announced my faith, uh, he sent me that rosary to give me protection, and I've carried it with me every day since. My goodness. With the stuff that you're about to uncover with these, with this new film, yeah. Sounds of Freedom, I think maybe you're gonna need some of that protection. So it's my honor to, to pass that on to you. Thank you very much. Navy SEAL gifting Jim a rosary? Huh. A Catholic military in the United States? Could the Vatican be using United States military for their crusades around the world? Cardinal Matteo Zuppi, as a special envoy from Pope Francis, traveled to the capital of the United States as part of the Vatican's peace mission for Ukraine. On the second day, he met with President Joe Biden. The White House published a press release saying the president expressed his support for the Pope's ongoing ministry and leadership. He also praised the news of U.S. Cardinal-elect Robert Francis Prevost, prefect of the Dicastery for Bishops. President Biden and Cardinal Zuppi spoke of the Vatican's efforts to provide humanitarian aid to those suffering as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year and their work in returning the thousands of Ukrainian children deported to Russia. This is just one more step in the Vatican's ongoing mission of promoting peace and ending the violence in Ukraine. I like how they use this camera shot. The USA flag looks pretty good considering that it's waving alongside their master's flag. The Vatican, the Rosaries, and the United States. What a wonderful combination. You'll be a terrible Pope. The worst. I'm ready to wage a war without end against you. They chose a Pope they didn't know. And today, they began to understand. What do you intend to do? Revolution. Who are you, really? Last year, some observers thought this video showed Pope Francis performing an exorcism. It created a buzz on social media sites. The Vatican strongly denied that the Pope was performing an exorcism. It said the Pope was conveying blessings. The Pope was conveying blessings.
It follows a day of faith and spiritual fulfillment for America's most devout president in decades, his private meeting with Pope Francis extending an hour and 15 minutes, President Biden giving the Pope a ceremonial commander coin and praising his courage. You are the most significant warrior for peace I've ever met. Demonstrating their close bond, this their fourth meeting, but his first as president, Mr. Biden was at ease with his church's leader. God love him. Praise be Jesus Christ. Right now, many of the world's elite are meeting in Davos for the World Economic Forum. I consider this part of the whole new world order thing. The world's rich elite trying to decide how we ordinary people should live our lives. I actually wrote a little book called Hold My Beer, an apocalypse that touches on this whole new world order phenomena. It's a fictional book. Take it with a grain of salt. It's meant to be amusing, but it's available on Amazon. Hold My Beer, an apocalypse. Again, touches on the whole new world order thing and also the reality of escaping. Now, as children of God, part of our dignity is that we can, we can make decisions. This is a perfect example of what I was talking about. A false light. A Catholic priest is not afraid to talk about or expose the alleged New World Order. Maybe to an extent even expose his own system that he is a part of, the Vatican. And why? Because the real plan is to unite all men under one leader, the Antichrist, to fight the phony New World Order they created. They give you these men, these leaders by design, a controlled opposition, nothing more. They still work in the industry, they still make millions of dollars in Satan's system, and they are still being seen and heard by the millions. For example, your Alex Jones, Andrew Tates, David Ikes, Russell Brands, Tucker Carlson's, Jordan Peterson's and so on. Ye shall know them by their fruits. The best lies are based on truths. Vladimir Lenin once said, the best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. I don't go to uh, the devil to play the devil. I think make, many actors make that mistake. Go to God to tell you who the devil is. That's what I do. And it also gives me a protection What's the um, difference? What's the difference, Jim? Like, because that also bears on how you protect yourself from such things. Um, the different, the, uh, and are you saying um, the difference in the, the difference is, is that I, I play the truth. So if you go and play, go to the devil to play the devil, the devil will deceive you and put something up there that uh, deceives the public. He'll always try to hide in the shadow. He'll always try, because he doesn't like the light, even though he's called the light, the illuminator, um, the uh, uh, Lucifer. Um, and he tries to mimic God. He tries to be like God. So there's always like, um, the, if God has love, and what we see as love, he creates lust. He's always trying to be like that. Uh, superiors mentioned to him when they said to him that his faith might protect him from, I love his question. from what was... Okay, go ahead, ma'am. This is the best interview I've ever had in my life. I love your line of questioning and um, getting to what, what is real. My job uh, is to give what I know to be absolutely certain and real. I hooked into Tim has a childlike quality to him, and I stay with that innocence. And that and don't take that innocence as weakness. Or, uh, and um, so when I read the scripture, I, I feel truth, good, evil, and I find the good. And let that just pierce the darkness. And it has to pierce. And I know what that light is. And I know that deception. That I don't know if it's just me, but why does it feel like he's reading a script? It feels like he can barely even talk. Comes in through your ego. And the other one is the light side that tells you might what you might not want to hear, but you ought to hear. And it's not manipulative. It's truth. So I, I go to that side, then I pray, then I go through it. Like the passion of the Christ, 
I looked at the shroud of time. Yeah, well, I think we did pretty well, and I'm pretty happy with our kids. But there, I think I, I didn't bring our kids to church. We didn't bring our kids to church, and that was a mistake. Um, it was a mistake because, you know, our, I would say our familial environment was pretty religious in its orientation, fundamentally. You know, the cynics used to say in our town, and this is when religion was beginning its the descent that it's undergone particularly in the last 30 years, like all these hypocritical Christians, you know, they go to church on Sunday for an hour and then they're just as evil and conniving the rest of the week. It's like, you know, fair enough, how hypocritical, fair enough, but what are you going to do? Re you're going to replace that with like zero time trying to be good? That's your improvement? It's like you got that hour and you're trying stupidly and hypocritically to be good and that's pretty pathetic but it seems to be a lot better than not ever trying it at all so and so I did learn you know in in, in Sunday school uh, despite my the impossibility of sitting still during that period of time and the fact that I didn't want to go to school yet another day um, I did learn the biblical stories in some depth and that was insanely useful. So, uh, you know, I think we, I think that would have been, that would probably would have been good for us, I think. And uh, our granddaughter just got baptized and everybody seemed pretty happy about that. And so... Whereas infant baptism in the Bible, babies and small children are not capable of making that decision. They don't understand what it means to give your life to Christ and become born again. I didn't notice that, like, who cared what I thought? Because I, I was a 13-year-old kid. It's like, why was this about what I thought? Who cared what I thought? I shouldn't have even cared. What I Who is known for sprinkling infants once they are born? Oh, that's right. Roman Catholicism. So Jordan Peterson has decided to go to a traditional Latin Mass, which I th found very interesting. Of all of the, the different rites in the churches, of all of the different experiences of the liturgy, that he decided to go to the traditional Latin Mass. As many people know, I love the traditional Latin Mass. I love to experience the, La the Mass as saints experienced for centuries and centuries and centuries. And this argument that at least go to church, be hypocritical and pretend to be a Christian is just pathetic and disgusting. Does God approve this kind of thing? This lukewarm mentality? This fakery? No, he doesn't. And look at his suit, the colors, red and blue, the colors of Freemasonry, the two opposites working towards the same goal, reaching that illumination, the Jacob's Ladder. So I didn't know anything, and so, you know, maybe some of you are loath to join a civic organization or a political party or a church because, you know, aren't they corrupt and hypocritical? It's like, yeah, yeah, they are, so are you. And and if they're so damaged and you're so wise and wonderful, like, why don't you just go there and fix them up a bit? You know, because you could do that instead of just pretending that you're above all that because you're definitely not. And, and so, so we didn't handle that as well. well. Now, let me get this story right. The press claim that you claim to be the son of God. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes, you see, the thing is that uh, see, it's, quite, it's quite funny, really. You know, 2,000 years ago, had a guy called Jesus sat here and said these same things, you would still be laughing. It's really, really funny that we've not really moved on that much. Was it, was it a great shock for you to discover this at 38? Well, I, th I think the... <laughs> I, think the word, I think the word is gobsmacked. But again, again, you know the best way of removing negativity is to laugh and be joyous. So I'm delighted that there's so much laughter in the audience tonight. But no, um, it's a... But just let, just let me, just let me say this. They're laughing at you. They're not laughing with you. Fine. The other thing is, there is this great illusion, you know, that Jesus was born and stood up and said, I know who I am. It was revealed to him in stages. He was very, very close to beginning the mission which is described in the Bible, but not described brilliantly accurately. Um, 
before he knew who he was. And when he came out, Terry, and said, I am the Son of God, I am an aspect of the soul of the Godhead incarnate because of things that need to be done on this planet urgently, um, people laughed, people ridiculed. And in the end, you know, they crucified him. First of all, why me? Well, why anybody? I mean, people would have said to Jesus, and many other people like Jesus that have not been written into history. I mean, that was the most famous uh, effort of this kind to wrest control of this planet from these forces. But there have been many before that. They would have said, why you? You're a carpenter's son, for goodness sake. Who the heck are you? So, so, that, that's, that's, so, yeah, so but, why anyone? You, you are, you're saying you're, you're part of, you were part of Jesus' soul before. Precisely. You're also part of many other people's lives on the way through As history. As we all have been. Many, we, we've all been uh, on this earth and uh, incarnated into different physical bodies many times. It's called reincarnation. But For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. If reincarnation was true, then there wouldn't be any point for Jesus to die on the cross, since we would be in an infinite loop of reincarnation and just continue living without any real consequences. But thank the Lord, it's not the case. And as it is appointed unto man to die once, but after this, the judgment. <laughs> this is intriguing. I believe the word is evil, people. Evil! This will come in real handy when they redecorate hell. <laughs> Can't you just feel the darkness, the dark forces working within it? It's enough to make a nun go bald. <laughs> this piece represents man's eternal quest to destroy the Alaskan king crab in his natural habitat. Either that or it's just a big ugly eye and I hate it. You take my panty! I'm giving it a sty. <laughs> Is that a gang sign? Have you, uh... Oh, like, you don't know what it is. You don't know what that is. I have no idea. Well, you don't know. Jimmy Fallon doesn't know. David Letterman doesn't know. Well, we don't know. All the comics and show business don't know what this is. <laughs> right? Yeah. What is it? Come on, Jimmy. Seriously. The time is up. People are hip to this kind of stuff. I, I'm here tonight to blow the lid off it, to be the whistleblower. I'm sick and tired of the secrets and the lies. It is the secret symbol of the Luminati, and you're a part of it, and it is it, the all-mocking tongue. Oh. I like These characters that have become so maligned and marginalized, even in my lifetime where I st still worked in mainstream media, where I st still worked in mainstream media. People like Alex Jones or David Icke, they were like, even people that were skeptical about them or even people that ridiculed them didn't try to posit them as dangerous. Like, and the same I'm assuming with Robert Kennedy. They were sort Well, of the David Icke one, they always made fun of him for lizard people. Because yeah. he always would say that there's shapeshifters and they're lizards and there was no evidence. It just seemed really preposterous. And then in the beginning of the pandemic, he was trying to connect COVID with 5G. There was a lot of weird, like, he's got some squirrely ones. Believe it or not, like, it's, it's hard to say, like, to the general public, Alex Jones is way more reliable right. than David Icke. But he's way more reliable than David Icke. Alex made a tremendous mistake with Sandy Hook, and he did that in a time of his life where he's experiencing a psychotic break. He was drinking a lot, and he was having a, a mental breakdown, and he really believed that everything was a conspiracy, and that the government is essentially run by these evil demons who are trying to depopulate America and ruin people, and he thought they were trying to take away people's guns, and he was convinced that someone someone had convinced him i don't know how he i don't know what documentaries or what videos he saw but he was convinced that they were using crisis actors and that they were they were orchestrating a false flag he was obviously very wrong yes i have several clips of alleged victims of this shooting that shall not be named where the victims could barely hide their smiles and laughter the duping delight 
I just can't show it here because it will be instantly blocked by the military that runs the internet and orchestrates these psychological operations. One of these days I'll think of something how to show it to you. He, and is admitted that he was wrong about that, but he's been right about a lot of things, so many things. And, and I, I've talked about this many times, but he was the guy who told me about Epstein's Island more than a decade ago, and I thought it was the craziest thing I'd ever heard. I was like, what are you saying? There's an island, like it sounds like a plot in a movie. There's an island where they, they fly famous rich scientists and politicians, and they compromise them with underage girls and get it on film so they could use it against them. I'm like, what? That sounds like horseshit. That sounds like lizard people. It sounds like, you know, 5G creates COVID. Same thing. Yeah. But turns out it was true. And it's one of many things. He was the one, that, the first one to warn me about a social credit score system. He's like, they're going to try to implement a social credit score system and your money is going to be tied. They'll have centralized digital currency and your money will be tied to your social credit score system and you step out of line, you won't be able to buy things. You won't be able to travel. You won't be able to do anything. They're going to try to keep you within a 15 minute radius of your home and they're starting to do that in places. Russell Brand, a friend of Jonathan Rumi? You gotta to listen to Under the Skin this week because I'm with Bishop Stephen Cottrell. You're an actual bishop, aren't I'm you? I'm a real bona fide bishop. <laughs> it's not, this isn't a game. No, it's not. What did we talk about? I think it started off with a book that I've written that you came across, reflecting on Stanley Spencer's paintings. That's right, and we used it as a launch pad to talk about Christ in the wilderness, the relevance of Christ today, what are the principles of Christianity, what, what is the value of Christianity in an advanced capitalist society. It was a very, very, very lovely conversation, and I think What's, what's beautiful for me is having a conversation where you can actually spend time talking about these things. Because in our soundbite culture, everybody wants a quick answer, a quick fix. And I felt our conversation was a, was a, was a long bath rather than a shower. I'm glad that you're using <laughs> a metaphors in which we are both naked and immersed yeah. in water. Yeah, yeah. You being yeah. a bishop yeah. Yeah. and I me not, being a roguish comic. I know, but not say any more till my, till my lawyer gets here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Bishop Stephen. Listen to it under the this skin. This Illuminati. Oh, yeah, the Illuminati. Nah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are these people? Because you, I, I, the only thing, the first time I heard about it, yeah, mm. Susan Boyle did the ice bucket challenge and they said <laughs> there was an Illuminati symbol on her swimsuit when she did it. And they were going, oh, she's a part of the Illuminati. <laughs> and I didn't know. So I was reading about it and then it turned up in your book. Are they really lizards? Apparently there's this. <laughs> Apparently there's this group I don't know called the Illuminati. It was behind the scenes, governing everything, running all the top businesses, running all the top organisations, and evidently this shadowy organisation are communicating through Susan Boyle's ice bucket challenge. <laughs> I don't know. But if there is, if there's a secret fucking organisation, Alan, and I ain't been invited to join it, I'm going to be cheesed off. Yeah. <laughs> Because they say everyone, they say Beyonce, Jay-Z. I think if you go like that, that means you're in. Doing a triangle, but for me, that just means Toblerone. <laughs> so you, you'd tell me if you were in the Illuminati. I would, if I was in it, I would get you in. I'd say, look, we're doing would well, you say but... to me like that? Uh, Alan. Yeah, Alan, yeah. Alan will be a wicked Illuminati. Okay. He's got his own show. Oh, yeah. He's a lovely fellow. He's gay yeah. as you like. Bring him in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not the lizards ones, are they? I think I don't know where they intersect with the lizards, mate, because that's where it gets a little bit above my pay grade, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'd like it if at the end of this we got into Buckingham Palace and said, Your Majesty, off with that crown. And she went, Oh, hello! <laughs> <laughs> well into that. <laughs> mm. I'd still love to see a lizard, though, you know. What do you mean? One unveil itself? Yeah. Well,. Oh, I, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> what is for? Yeah. You proud of yourself? <laughs> all that, all my theories. <laughs> one fucking yeah, sound yeah. effect <laughs> joke. <laughs> right, we're going depth to the structure of society. We'll talk about the Bilderberg Group and how corporations are dominating the world. And then, and then we'll do the fly joke. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good fly joke. Well, so I'm going to try to combat that 
while telling you about my new tattoo and my other tattoos. Particularly this controversial little guy that never fails to get a little mention from people who will ignore every other tattoo and every other thing about me in order to go ah ah because <laughs> 33 is connected somehow in ways i don't know because i'm get this not in the illuminati and if you say someone's in the illuminati you've got to at least sort of go like and the reason i think they're in the illuminati is because what they're doing and saying is leading to this which the illuminati would love by the way Right? Like the Illuminati, if there is such a thing as the Illuminati, presumably they're a powerful centralized group who are interested in subduing individuals and controlling and instantiating institutional power so dominant centralized forces can continue to uh, flourish while ordinary people suffer, right? So that would mean things like telling people, hey, everything's fine in the world, everything's great. And then you go, yeah, but you would do that because you're like a controlled opposition. Yeah, but you would do that because you're like a controlled opposition. It's like, well, as Neil deGrasse Tyson once said, is there anything that I could say that would make you believe, for example, that, you know, America did land on the moon or that the earth is round? And if the person he's arguing with says, no, there's nothing you could say, he said, well, there's no point in having a conversation then, is there? Because when I spoke to him, I goes, do you think that they, the Americans really went to the moon? He goes, man, there's a hole, like you can go to Cape Canaveral and there's all these like boxes of, and files of complicated mathematical equations. It just would be such a mad thing if they didn't. Or if the Earth is flat, what's the benefit of that theory? So in a sense, this has started about tattoos, but it's quickly got into conspiracy theories because like, I'm open to listening to conspiracy theories because there are no doubt conspiracies between powerful sets of individuals and powerful institutions but the aim is always to increase and impose power to maintain control if you can't see how it if you can't join the dots then it's stupid it's just baroque storytelling unless you can go yeah because that means that this would happen now for example someone having a 33 tattoo on their arm but like what would you what's the benefit of that if you are actually a part of a sort of a secret cartel controlling reality, do you have to mask that fact? And like, oh yeah, but yeah, you would do that. Oh, so it's that many layers of double bluff. To, I mean, like for me, that's like why. And all of a sudden, what are we talking about now? We're not talking about how do you get people to band together to challenge authority. That's the only thing worth talking about. Pointing out corruption inviting people to go within themselves, to awaken themselves, to confront authority. All the other stuff is just like flim flam, in my view. Anyway, so that tattoo is because I love the Lord Jesus Christ and it's a sort of a lucky number, basically, because I thought I was gonna die when I was 32, then I obviously didn't, as you can see. And uh, so now I love the number 33 and when I see it, I feel like I'm on the right path. I love the number 33 and when I see it, I feel like I'm on the right path. This is Lord Krishna. He, Lord Krishna, the master of all realities and non-realities and potential realities, the world of dark matter that makes up 80 or 90 percent of the reality that we even understand right now. Lord Ganesh, remover, remover of obstacles, the Kundalini serpent, awaken the lower survival and sexual energies and turn it into divine spiritual energy, not that sexuality can't be divine. This is an invitation to become what you are. Take your inheritance, become who you are. This is Durga, a goddess of power, fighting for divine femininity with the initial letters of my wife's name and my two daughters' names. This is Jesus Christ who I love. This is Jesus Christ who I love. These are the chakras, the energy centers of the body. That is the Kunda, it's a Sikh sign, two swords of justice, holding a sword of truth thrusting through the world. That is West Ham United, the football team that I love. This new one is a William Blake drawing, and I didn't really know what it was when I got it because I just liked the drawing. But it's, uh, as you can see, it's like a spiraling serpent, which I think of as like sort of original DNA stuff, and a falling female form. And I think it represents the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. Now, how do you regard that? The Garden of Eden is the perfect state, the walled place of perfection. In it are all like, a, is, the, is masculinity and femininity and the serpent energy and the divine knowledge and Yahweh, a kind of God figure overseeing it. Some people like Eric Fromm, for example, believe that the act of biting the apple, some, like Terence McKenna would say, is that sort of plant medicine and entering into knowledge, awakening personal self-consciousness. And given that they feel ashamed afterwards and cover themselves up, there's an argument of saying, oh, what, what the apple is self-awareness is separating from animal consciousness and becoming awake becoming aware like oh my fucking god i'm a person i'm a person
There was a terrible movie called Army of One, starring Nicolas Cage and Russell Brand where they were mocking God. Russell Brand in particular was flashing sixes and in the movie was driving a bus with an all-seeing eye on it. Hello, Gary. God? I've got a favor to ask you, Gary. A favor? I need you to go over to Pakistan and capture Bin Laden for me. Capture Bin Laden? We're talking about destiny, Gary. Oh my God! Get in the truck, Gary. Yes, my love. Where are you going, Gary? I don't know. You don't even know where you're going, do you? You're just wandering around aimlessly, no particular direction, no better than a paramecium. A what? Paramecium, Gary, it's a single cellular life form that I created some time ago. I was pretty proud of it back then, still around to this day because Noah, in his infinite wisdom, chose to put it on the ark along with syphilis and gonorrhea. You're, you're all knowing, right? Yeah, I am all knowing. Well, yeah. Why don't you help me? I mean, just like a, a trap, help a hint. There's no hints, Gary. This is not a treasure hunt or a quiz show. You got freedom of choice, freedom of thought. Do you know how beautiful that is? You, I mean, I know every thought before you think it, and let me tell you, a lot of the thoughts you've got coming up are pretty stupid. I am God. I am the question and the answer. Yes, my lord. Sorry, lord. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just lost. You got any idea how many times I hear that every day? I'm lost. Then I was found. I'm blind. Now I can see. I'm tired of that lost shepherd, lost sheep. Yes, Lord. Don't yes, Lord me. Yes, Lord. I said don't say that. Yes, Lord. Gary. Yes, Lord. What? No, Lord. Are you saying no to me, Gary? No. I'm doing too much to worry about this. I've got 14 trillion things to deal with right now. I'm doing a million things in this moment. I'm dealing with Hezbollah, Ebola, some guy called Obama, Coca-Cola. I've got a lot of to deal with. Do you understand me? But I just want you to be happy. Well then, Gary, try this. I help those that help themselves. Sometimes I'm still trying to understand how people don't notice that the whole media is controlled by a few corporations. And it wasn't a coincidence that Tucker was fired by Fox News. He just changed the platform like many other so-called truth seekers. Now he's often featured on Elon Musk's Twitter, seen by the millions, doing interviews with other gatekeepers, with controlled opposition. It's just a show. They claim that they're censored, but not really. It's all part of the same Hegelian dialectic plan. I find it funny how most of them all of a sudden are finding God. Yeah, of course. So if you are all in on the things that produce the latter basket of outcomes, what you're really advocating for is evil. That's just true. I'm not calling for a religious war, far from it. I'm merely calling for an acknowledgement of what we're watching. Which is not what, and I'm not certainly not backing the Republican Party. I mean, ugh. I'm not making a partisan point at all. I'm I'm just noting what's super obvious. Like those of us who are in our mid 50s are caught in the past in the way that we think about this. One side's like, no, no, you know, I've got this idea, and we've got this idea, and let's have a debate about our ideas. They don't want a debate. Those ideas won't produce outcomes that any rational person would want under any circumstances. Those are manifestations of some larger force acting upon us. It's just so obvious. It's completely obvious. And two, maybe we should all take just like 10 minutes a day to say a prayer about it. I'm serious, like why not? And I'm saying that to you not as some kind of evangelist. I'm literally saying that to you as an Episcopalian. The Samaritans of our time. I'm coming to you from the most humble and lowly theological position you can. I'm literally an Episcopalian, okay? And even I have concluded it might be worth taking just 10 minutes out of your busy schedule to say a prayer for the future, and I hope you will. 
Russell Brand has been an actor, a comedian, a podcast host for decades. All of a sudden, he's one of the most forceful voices for the truth in the English-speaking world. He's also a deeply interesting person with a lot of insights about God. Amazingly, Russell Brand. We sit down with him for a long conversation. A brand new episode of Tucker Carlson today. Here's a small part of it. Tucker Carlson says the RFK is more of a threat to the mainstream media establishment than Donald Trump. So, with RFK getting support from both sides of the aisle, is Tucker Carlson right? Could RFK be the man to bring down the establishment? Should I just ask him? <laughs> <laughs> How hard is it to imitate Russell Brand beyond imitation? I never in my life thought that I, a longtime viewer, would be addressing 6.4 million awakening wonders and bringing them on a journey to truth and freedom. But that is indeed about to happen. Stay tuned. I'm so grateful to you for coming this. here. Do you like you it? You're happy? I love it. Have you got everything you need? Can I offer you I've any more my, snacks? Nicotine, I've gum? I've got my nicotine. I've got my Pellegrino. I had my coffee. I'm, I'm in my happy place. I'm so glad that I'm so glad that you're comfortable here. Thank you so much. It means a lot that you've given us uh, this oh, interview. It. Thank you very much, Tucker. Um, mate, so... Uh, I don't know the real motivation behind Russell's logo in his studio, but it does look very familiar to one thing that's been subliminally programmed into our heads for three years straight. Tucker and Russell are buddies. Just look at them. All these people at the top are. It's us, the peasants, that are given the illusion that these actors are fighting for us and that they are on the same side as we. Um, mate, so uh, like, I suppose what we're asking there is that it seems that you said that Trump was no longer relevant in the political conversation. He was no longer the lightning rod. He was no longer the berserker of American politics. Loads of people on our platform absolutely love Donald Trump. Trump, they see him as the solution to America's problems. They see him as the great swamp drainer. It seems you have occupied varying positions on Trump at various times. Um, where are you on Donald Trump now? And particularly perhaps how that relates to the emergence of radical anti-establishment figures within the Democrat Party, notably RFK. India Frank, the president of the United States of America, Mr. Donald Trump. Presidential selections are exactly the same in my eyes. Yo, what's cracking? You know what it is. It's your homeboy Ice Cube. Um, and some of you may not have realized um, that I'm not part of the club. And a lot of you listening to me right here, right now, you're not part of the club either. And what I realized with the club is what makes them so mad is when you don't want to be a part of their fucking club, that pisses them off. What club am I talking about? I'm talking about the club of gatekeepers that we all got to deal with. You know who they are and they definitely know who they are. Um, a lot of people would be like, what, who, who, who? Come on, man, stop playing. Okay, now here's the other one. What's your take on the Illuminati? Like everybody's talking about that right now with the, uh, you know, certain images and stuff. Um, I mean, I ain't really down with no secret societies. You know right. what I'm saying? I think, uh, you know, all this secret shit got the world fucked up. So right. I ain't really down with none of that. Okay. They can do what they want to do. Right. They know where I stand on it. You know what I mean? My resume is is and track record on that bullshit is is uh, public and been yeah. public for years. So right. they know I ain't down with that shit. And, uh, you know, to me, all secret societies are, are up to no good. Why would you be doing this of all interviews? I mean, you could do an interview with anyone. You're doing an interview with me. Obviously, you're, you're going to take abuse for doing that. Like, why would you do that? Um, because I think it's silly. 
not to talk to people. Um, I think whether we agree or not, right? that has nothing to do with it. You know, it's like, this is what it's all about. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's, let's debate. And, and, you know, I've been shut Wait, out. Wait, that sounds like right-wing extremism and <laughs> what about ism? What, what, but I've been shut out, you know, some, some platforms will not have me on. Why? Um, they don't like that I'm, you know, an independent thinker. I'm not part of the herd. I'm not part of uh, the go along to get along gang, so to speak. So, um, you know, I'm an outsider. And so, you know, I'm not part of the club. So I have to, I have to go places for, for one that I'm welcome yeah. and where I can voice my opinion without somebody, um, you know, saying I'm a bad person and that they never want to have me on their platform again. What what platforms have have banned you? I've been I've been um, you know I tried to go on I tried to go on the View. They didn't have me on the View. Why? Um, well, a few of the guests just really didn't like where I was coming from. So, uh, or a few of the hosts. I mean, so that's what I was told by the producers. <laughs> So in the United States, the I think the belief is that you were charged with human trafficking. Yeah, that's human trafficking because what you do is you force a girl to work against her will for financial gain. That's human trafficking. And their justification for this is that girls do TikTok. Some girls I know who they found who say they're not victims have TikTok accounts. Are they condition wheels? Attention, I'm watching The Matrix has attacked me. And what would be the exact reasoning behind this gesture? Who is he signaling? Us? You must be kidding. What's with the secret society symbolism that he's using all the freaking time? Does anyone still believe this CIA government tool? He's signaling his handlers that everything is under control. This is all staged people, just like his created fake persona on the internet. This hand symbol is very innocently my father's hand symbol. When my father played chess, he used to play chess like this. So I adopted it, almost to show respect to my father. That's why I adopted it and then I got comfortable doing it. I put up posts on social media showing my dad doing the position a bunch of times and I do the position a bunch of times. It doesn't mean anything. I don't know where it's from. People are trying to find these old pictures of things and put it all together. But that's the internet, right? It's just a chess thing. Going around TikTok now that I've worshiped devil or something. Bro, yeah, something's going around like you have this satanic friend. Yeah, so inside of my organization, which is called The War Room, the guy, one of the guys who works for us is a hypnotist. So he kind of looks like a bit of a magician and he's a hypnotist. Jeez. And he's a hypnotist. And he's a hypnotist because he's one, he's very, very good at it. He's a hypnotist, which is a hypnotist who's part of the organization. There's pictures of me sitting next to him. This hand symbol, so I adopted it. And then I got comfortable doing it. It's not, it doesn't mean anything. I don't know where it's from. And if we all knew, if I, if I was going to go to hell, I was going to take over. I walk into hell and the devil's like, oh, I'm going to burn you. So you're going to well, I'm going to stand there and let you burn me. You look like a no, I'm not these mask wearers. No, you are burning me. You touch me, I'll you up. Some right wing people on the internet think I'm a CIA plant. Because my father was with intelligence. I'm not a CIA plant. So I start doing it and people start saying, that's an Illuminati hand symbol. He's a Freemason hand symbol, hand symbol. I'm not associated with the Illuminati. It's more just like supreme, the ability to supremely recall information. When I was with my father, if he needed your phone number, he'd ask, what's your phone number? And you'd say it once, and that was it for the rest of his life. He didn't have to write it down. You'd tell him an address, that was it for the rest of his life. He never wrote anything down. He never had to repeat anything to him. My father, when he died, someone messaged me who was in, because my father was in the CIA. 
He held the, fa the record of the CIA, the CIA record for the fastest assimilation of a foreign language. My father learned Russian within two and a half weeks from zero. Like, really? he, yeah, he would just read a book. He just read the dictionary. Like to these people, it's just like, just, just read it. When my dad died, James Altucher, do you know who he is? Mm -hmm. my James Altucher, you can ask him about my dad. Him and James played a game and it was a draw in the end. And James did a tribute to my father saying that he was just a scary dude. Like he was just supremely smart, right? So, so I, when, when you were growing up, did you know your dad was in the CIA? Uh, he had left the military by the time I was any, I was like three when he left. Got it. To, okay. to, to pursue chess. Back when Tate was still a fighter, he was spotted covering his right eye in an interview after the fight. He was holding it for three minutes straight. Do you really need to cover your allegedly injured eye for so long that you can't even put your hands down? Is it glued to your face or what? I hope everything is all right with this uh, with this guy. One of those things, man. All Thank right. you. Good luck. Bye, everybody. And uh, like and share this video. You're aware of the media coverage of this, however. So I'm you're in jail for 90 days or yeah. more, and the rest of the world is talking about you. Do you know what they're saying? They're saying very heinous things, and I would hate to come across as a conspiracy theorist, Tucker, but I kind of have a feeling that this might be something to do with my influence and an attempt to slander my name. Perhaps I'm crazy. But the fact that they chose such a heinous crime and they report it so heavily and they won't shut up and keep repeating basically a slander attack day after day after day. Also considering the fact that other people who genuinely commit heinous crimes have far more favorable press coverage. I don't want you to think I'm a conspiracy theorist. Please, Tucker, I would hate for you to come here and call me crazy. But something very strange about it, and I think the... What, when Jeffrey Epstein's friends call you immoral? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the goal of it is certainly to slander my name, and uh -huh. I, I like to see it as a litmus test. I like to see it as an intelligence test. Anybody who wakes up and looks at me and goes, he's a human trafficker because of TikTok, those, they're fully gone. So, but, but from the way... Truth is this, so I, I knew it was coming. I absolutely not only knew it was coming because of how orchestrated it was. The only thing, and I'll state this at the beginning, the only reason I'm upset by being canceled is because I've expired one of my lives. Because first you get canceled, then they make up a reason to put you in jail, and if that fails, they kill you. So now I'm down to my last two lives, which is also why while I'm answering this question, I'm still being careful how I'm answering it. I'm not telling it's you It's scary. That. It's scary, because they've now, they've given me the warning, and I'm still running my mouth. Yeah. So that's scary. And who is they? Well, that's a good question. Even if I knew all their names, I wouldn't say it here. <laughs> but uh, Why wouldn't you say it here? I wouldn't say it here because they've already given me quite a few warnings. And I'm now at the point where I actually truly believe they're going to try and kill me. All those who needed to be silenced are six feet under and not on most popular podcasts in the world. But hey, people buy anything. They actually worship these clowns. I, I, so I, you've had messages from people I, trying to control you who you think would kill you? I understand that you get three strikes in this game. Strike one is they try and shut you up and discredit you, which I've just been through. Strike two is they try and put you in jail for no reason. And strike three is they kill you. And one of my strikes is now gone, and I now firmly believe that they're going to try and kill me. And people have car accidents, people get robbed, people get shot. And that's the unfortunate reality well, they look for quick solutions and the easiest solution is to kill me. I think I should stay and finish the process and I should walk with my head held high and suffer as much as I need to suffer to stick by my convictions and know that I'm an innocent person. And I refuse to break. I refuse to cry. I refuse to be depressed about it. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to smile regardless. And regardless of what happens to me, I want everyone to know that one, I would never kill myself. And two, I think that as a man, there's always going to be a degree of pain and suffering in your journey. I don't think you're ever going to become a successful man or be good at being a man without pain and suffering. And there's many times in my life where something terrible happened to me. And at the time, if I could change it, I would have. But retrospectively, you kind of look back and go, you know what? That was formulative That's right. for me. That's right. That is what God decided I needed to become who I became. So all of the pain and all the suffering I've ever gone through in my life ended up in the end building me into the person I am and I'm proud of who I am. 
So if God decides I need to go back to a Romanian dungeon for however many days, then all I can do is accept it and accept his plan and accept that it's going to make me a better person. And, and so you it. see the hand of God in your life? Absolutely. I think that he is the best of planners. And like I said, if you, if you retrospectively analyze all the times in life, you wish you could have changed things. Yes. He knew better. And I'm going to have to accept that. When did you conclude that? I think, I guess I always kind of knew. I was atheistic for a while when I was younger. But as you get older, you start to look at the world and understand that the thing for me was actually, I guess, a scientific principle. It was Newton's law of equal and opposite force. If there is evil in the world, and I'd like to think we both agree there certainly is, yes. there has to be an equal and opposite force, which is good. And I would like to think of that as God. Even the idea of God as a notion, even just as a concept, if that idea of God resists evil, then God is real. If you have two islands, you have two people, let's say a ship crashes, and you have two people who swim to two different islands, and one island they're atheists, savages, and they rip you apart, and the other island you get there and they believe in God and they believe they're not allowed to kill you. Even just their idea of God, God saved your life. So I think even just the concept of God in and of itself, if enough people believe in it makes them do good, then God must be true, and that's the equal and opposite force to the evil of the world. And this is how I, I view it. So I don't see how anybody with a conscience cannot believe in God anymore. That's such a profoundly different worldview from the one that we're presented with, I think. I changed my mind about God. I was wrong. So accordingly in this video, I wanna share with you what I used to believe, what I believe now, and what made me change my mind along the way. And also very importantly, I wanna share with you a few thoughts of mine that I have that will help us bring more God, not only into our lives, but also the world around us, which seems like it needs a lot more God right now. Because I don't know about you, but living in a world where Satan reigns and you and I and our families have to suffer the consequences doesn't really feel appealing to me. And also, quick disclaimer, this video is not intended to be a comedy video. And if that offends you, pray about it. What changed me? What happened, what I see that changed my mind? Well, one observation I've had over the past three years, especially, <laughs> I was, uh, hashtag pandemic. Over the past three years, I found myself accidentally getting more Christian. Like without even intentionally trying, like setting out on a mission, like, hey, I want to become more Christian. It's just been effortlessly happening for me. Now, I don't think I'm unique there because I've seen a lot of people and I've heard a lot of people telling me similar stories. So I asked the question, why are people getting more Christian without even trying? Welcome to the world of easy believism. No repentance of sin and no changed life. Accidentally becoming more Christian-like? How does that work? Salvation is not something you can put as a badge whenever you like it. Salvation is through Christ's sacrifice, coming to him as a broken sinner, seeking for help. And it's up to God to decide whether you're faking it or not. It's funny how people say, God knows my heart. That's true, he does. He knows that it's desperately wicked, and if you're just faking with him. It's not an intellectual decision, therefore that's why you never see a changed life with these clowns. They have no spiritual power. Plus, they're using the Vatican Bible versions. They're simply frauds. That's why if you're saved, you can see right through the game that they're playing. Because you can compare them with yourself, and they don't have the same testimony or struggles as other saved brethren have. Neither cold nor hot. Laodiceans. Here's what I believe to be true about that. The presence of evil and Satan that evil emanates from has never been more obvious, at least in my lifetime. The past three years, evil isn't hiding anymore. It's coming at us through authoritarianism, movements, people, groups, companies, governments, trying to invade our minds, invade our God-given free will. So as that's become more obvious, I think there's a natural polarity that happens. If you're not someone who's willing to do the devil's bidding, if you're not someone who's willing to propagate evil, then there's a natural occurrence that happens when you're in the presence of evil, 
you polarize to the other extreme. Like you, you may not even be consciously aware of it, but the presence of evil makes you lean away. And then, therefore, what direction are you leaning towards? Well, that would be the direction of God, certainly the opposite of evil, the opposite of Satan. So I think that's seeing the presence of evil. That's why I've just accidentally been getting more Christian, why so many other people are. Because right now, I think the evil that's in this world is doing a great service of driving a lot of people to find God in ways that they previously hadn't. Oh, side note, I want to be honest about this. I used to have shame about saying the word God. You know, back when I thought like, dude, I'm spiritual, I'm so cool, but not religious. I used to have shame about using the word God and instead I'd say, oh, the universe or uh, the all-knowing. I'd just create different names, but I actually just meant God. So I'm delighted to say now I have not only no shame about saying God, but I actually have joy in saying God. God. Yeah, that felt pretty good. Dallas Jenkins, the creator of The Chosen, who calls himself a Protestant, says that LDS, known as Mormons, worship the same Jesus. <laughs> and another interesting thing was that a rainbow flag was spotted on the set of The Chosen. It's right there in front of us. You can't make this stuff up. Dallas Jenkins, director of The Chosen, released a statement the other day on what he calls the LDS issue. And just because of this simple but beautiful statement, many people criticized the show, they refused to watch it, and are honestly being unchristian. But Dallas Jenkins reaffirms his defense of his Christian Latter-day Saint friends. I stand by the statement that those friends of mine that I'm referring to absolutely love the same Jesus that I do. When The Chosen was in its infancy, VidAngel, a company that is run and owned by LDS individuals, came to him and said, we want to help you crowdfund this show. We want to help you produce this show. And they did. Many of the early supporters of this show are Christian Latter-day Saints because we support his vision. We love his vision and we love the way he portrays our savior, Jesus Christ. If Dallas Jenkins is watching this video, I would like to thank him for defending those who share our faith in Jesus Christ. And what's funny about uh, the LDS folks is you guys seem to be, even though you're the most controversial, you seem to be the least confrontational. Um, <laughs> it's just like, hey, we're all, we all love Jesus. Let's just, uh, I just want to let you know we love the show. And when people start going, hey, you're a Mormon, you're going to hell. Uh, you're just like, hey, whatever. It's like, you just it kind of seems to roll off your back. Maybe it's because you're used to, to being on yeah. the outside sometimes. But, but uh, yeah, it's been so fascinating because um, even my family members, when we first started this relationship with VidAngel, part of it was, well, be, be careful because of the common misconceptions about, about uh, our different belief systems, but also just protecting the show. Like, will the audience be bothered by the fact that there are um, LDS people involved? Personally, I didn't really care because I've, I've worked with people of all different traditions or, I mean, I've worked with atheists. I've partnered with, with people who've distributed my movies who had zero desire to, you know, or connection to, to Christ and couldn't have cared less about it. So even if I had significant disagreements with the LDS community, which I've learned I have fewer than I thought I did, but even with that, I was okay. I was comfortable with that because as long as they're treating the show properly, that's all that matters. So it's been, I, I can honestly say it's been one of the top three most fascinating and beautiful things about this project has been my growing brother and sisterhood with people of the LDS community that I never would have known otherwise and learning so much about um, about your, your faith tradition um, and realizing, gosh, for all the stuff that maybe we don't see eye to eye on, that all happened, that's all based on stuff that happened after Jesus was here. Um, the stories of Jesus, we do agree on, and we we love the same Jesus. Um, that's not something that you often hear. Sometimes it's like, oh, you, uh, they that's believe in a different yeah, Jesus than we do. Statement. Yeah, no, it's the same. I mean, I'll 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 sink or swim on that statement, and I and it's controversial, and I. Um, I don't mind getting criticized 
at all for the show and I don't mind being called a blasphemer. I don't like it when my friends are. And um, I've made it very clear that um, if I go down, if I go down, I'm going down swinging, protecting my friends and my, my brothers and sisters. And so I don't deny we have a lot of theological differences, but we, we love the same Jesus. So um, I have, it, let's just start with the, the, the central question. Is it true that I said, um, which is what you've seen in some headlines or seen in some, some, uh, some titles of videos, Dallas Jenkins says, quote, and then it'll say Mormons or LDS, whatever term that they want to use, Mormons and evangelicals love the same Jesus, or LDS are Christians. Is it true that I said that? And the answer is no, um, I did not. I don't deny we have a lot of theological differences, but we, we love the same Jesus. Look, here's the thing when it comes to our, our uh, cast and crew and my own uh, beliefs and philosophies. I'm not an atheist, and neither is the production company an atheist. But I'm happy to work with those who are if they are working hard for the show. And uh, I don't police their social media. I don't, uh, my, my, uh, my company won't make any kind of formal statement about atheism, uh, speaking out against atheism. Uh, any disagreements I have with them would be discussed privately. And then the context of relationship and love, the content of my show speaks for itself. And the content of my show may end up, of course, disagreeing with atheism. Um, but uh, in terms of our personal relationships on set, uh, it's just not something that we discuss publicly. I'm not a Catholic, neither is the Chosen Inc. Catholic. I'm not a Mormon, neither is the Chosen Inc. Mormon. I'm not a Buddhist or any other non-Christian religion. I'm not a liberal personal, not that that has anything to do with, with uh, the show itself, but I'm not a liberal and neither is the Chosen Inc. Um, I don't celebrate pride. I don't celebrate pride month. I don't celebrate the pride flag. Uh, if I wore a shirt, I'd probably say humility on it just because uh, pride has gotten me in trouble, but uh, I, Neither and neither does the, the, the Chosen Inc. As, a, as an evangelical conservative, I'm actually probably a minority on our set. Um, and here's the thing, our cast and crew, the majority of them who believe the spectrum of things, including the things I just above, don't expect me to agree with them on everything and don't expect me to celebrate their thing or celebrate their cause. I love our cast and crew. I will go to war with them any day and I will stand in the breach to defend them any day and we are a family and always have been and we take that very seriously have you been following the pride flag controversy from the chosen set well now dallas jenkins has something to say about it for those who don't know in the recent youtube video of the chosen a pride flag was seen on one of the pieces of equipment during a scene between simon z and judas a pride flag can be spotted on the left of the screen now many fans were furious they filled all social media accounts of The Chosen with questions. Why is there a pride flag on a Christian show's set? This was one of the main questions we saw getting asked. Some commenters even said that the show is now cancelled for them and that they will never watch it again. A few fans have asked for their money back, referring to the donations they made. At first, The Chosen team was silent and didn't respond to all the comments, but later they did. On Twitter, they responded to John Root, who demanded an explanation for what happened. They said, just like with our hundreds of cast and crew who have different beliefs or no belief at all than we do, we will work with anyone on our show who helps us portray or honor the authentic Jesus. We ask that audiences let the show speak for itself and focus on the message, not the messenger because we'll always let you down. Many fans did not find this response satisfying. And after this, we're guessing the chosen cast and crew must have received so many messages that they no longer wanted to comment on it. Dallas even shared an Instagram story where he posted a photo of himself with the words, no comment on it. But he couldn't stay silent any longer and posted this on his Instagram. That we promoted a pride flag. It's not that I made some sort of statement, any kind of political statement to show that the show did anything significant or because the content of the show slipped or compromised or you're upset. Uh, about something that we actively promoted or anything like that. That's not what happened. You're upset or boycotting the show because our policy, my policy, I'll take it on mine, my partner's policy, is that we just don't stop one of our crew members from having a three inch pride flag on his own personal equipment. If that's enough for you to stop watching the show, that's fine. That's your choice. 
I just want us to be clear that that's what it is and not on these other issues or not on some of the headlines that you're seeing. In your bank account, the Federal Reserve announcing it has gone live with its new FedNow instant payment system, a system that should allow households and businesses to send payments and receive money immediately without those troubling three-day holds on checks and waiting for payments to clear in the sender's account and waiting for the bank to open on Monday or after a holiday. The FedNow system is an instant payment system. It's available 24-7, 365 days a year. To begin with, 35 banks and 16 service providers have already signed up. Those banks include things like J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo, as well as smaller credit unions and other banks. Unclear if the banks are going to charge for this instant payment. They are charged, but they may or may not pass that along to consumers. Uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell saying in a press release, over time, as more banks choose to use this tool, the benefits to individuals and businesses will include enabling a person to immediately receive a paycheck or a company to instantly access funds when an invoice in, is paid. This doesn't eliminate the PayPals and the Venmos of the world or Zelle, theoretically, they could use the FedNow system, which is a bank-to-bank -bank system, to send payments, but it's unclear, guys, if those services now face a new challenge from banks of all sizes that can offer similar services. I'll be honest. Of all, of all the things you do and all the companies you run, I think it's all awesome. The one thing that does concern me, and I know concerns a lot of people out there, so I do have to bring it up, which is Neuralink. Sure. So, firstly, can you explain what Neuralink is and what the goal of it is? Uh, we put a, a chip in your brain to control your mind. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Concerns not alleviated. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> jump right in. Yeah. <laughs> Step right up. Who wants one? Uh, we put a, a chip in your brain to control your mind. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny, Mr. Musk. Uh, great sense of humor because Looks like the Fed now will eventually become this mark of the beast system with chips in your foreheads and your right hands. Maybe they'll even use your technology to do so. Spoke as if the Bible was true. We should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Um, if I were to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. Start and ask you if you could elaborate a little bit on what we've seen on the video. I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. You know, you know all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, and he's like, yeah, you sure you can control the demon? <laughs> then work out. <laughs> and that was all that I wanted to show in the video today. I think there's more than enough proof of what was shown to make a decision about whether you should support Hollywood movies or not. But you know what makes me sick the most? The fact that most of you, multiple thousands of people, are here just to watch these videos for entertainment purposes only. I would say over 90% of you are here just for that. And you're not helping me in this spiritual battle because the support is just not there. Some of you have no problem supporting some foul mouth streamer that plays video games all day and hates God, but you can't support honest Christian channels. And that's the sad part, because there could be done so much more for the Lord, yet me being only one man behind this channel and having a family, I have to look elsewhere to be able to provide for my family. Therefore the content is lagging behind and I have to turn my eyes away from the work of the Lord. The body of Christ must hinder the system of the Antichrist. We are the ones stopping this whole thing before God catches us up to be with him. And then he will open the first seal to unleash the Antichrist. Do you even realize that? I thank everyone who so far has supported me and I mean it. I really do. All 75 of you on Patreon and those who tipped me once, once or twice on PayPal but a few hundred dollars a month is not enough for me to continue let alone that I have to pay almost that amount for the website. I hate this monetary system so much, but that's the reality we currently live in. I never want to ask for help or beg people because the feeling I get from doing it eats me from inside. I'm just being real, I'm not that kind of person. <laughs> but imagine for a moment how would you like to go to work and not get paid at the end of the month? 
would you still continue working? Do you even realize how much time and effort it takes to connect all the dots, watch hundreds of hours of this filth, and make a well-presented logical video just for you? And some of you can't even click the like button to push the video through the algorithm so that more people would see these lies that surrounding us daily. It reminds me so much of James chapter 2 verses 15 and 16. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth if profit? You say, Great work, brother, keep them coming, keep it up. Well, how am I going to keep it up? Are you going to help me to keep it up? Or it's just vain words? Plus I get so much comments telling me to kill myself, which is telling me that they're casting spells on me and my family. It's such a joy, you wouldn't believe. I'm being sarcastic here, of course. I know that my reward is in heaven, I look forward to it, but it's just sad that people are so unthankful having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, as Paul says in 2 Timothy. You know, I'll say this, find a ministry or a channel that stands for the word of God, the King James Bible. Don't leave good men that are fighting spiritual battles for you alone in the battlefield. They need your help. You believe the Bible or don't you? And lastly, those of you that are my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, may God protect you in these dangerous times. And to those of you who got offended by my words or the video, go rent another movie on Netflix with Mel Gibson or support other millionaires who don't really care about you at all. You idolize and worship your Hollywood scumbag so much just because you see them on TV. It's, it's insane. May God bring his wrath and judgment on this world. Here's a song to memorize. <laughs>